Part Four, Mr. President. Chapter Eleven, The Buck Stops Here. Look at Little Truman now, muddy, battered, bruised, and how. Chicago Tribune. One. Everybody wants something at the expense of everybody else, and nobody thinks much of the other fellow. Truman wrote to his mother and sister at the beginning of autumn, nineteen forty-five. There were more prima donnas per square foot in public life in Washington than in all the opera companies ever to exist. He told them another day, writing at his desk in October when the trees outside the White House had begun to turn. On a bunting draped platform at an American Legion fair at Carothersville, Missouri, he said that after every war came an inevitable letdown. Difficulties would follow. You can't have anything worthwhile without difficulties. Mistakes would be made. No one who accomplished things could expect to avoid mistakes. Only those who did nothing made no mistakes. All Americans must cooperate, he said, dedicating a dam at Gilbertsville, Kentucky. It was time for everyone to cut out the foolishness and get in harness. A war president no longer, he was finding the tasks of peace more difficult and vexing than he ever imagined. We want to see the time come when we can do the things in peace that we have been able to do in war," he had said with such conviction in July at the small military ceremony in the cobbled square in Berlin. If we can put this tremendous machine of ours to work for peace, we can look forward to the greatest age in the history of mankind. But how? How possibly now, when no one wanted to cooperate any longer? His troubles had begun with his first post-war message to Congress, only days after the Japanese surrender ceremonies on board the battleship Missouri in Tokyo Bay. Sent to the Hill on September sixth, the message was sixteen thousand words in length, the longest since the Theodore Roosevelt era, and presented a twenty-one point domestic program that included increased unemployment compensation, an immediate increase in the minimum wage, a permanent fair employment practices committee, tax reform, crop insurance for farmers. A full year's extension of the War Powers and Stabilization Act, meaning the government would keep control over business, and federal aid to housing to make possible a million new homes a year. We must go on. We must widen our horizon further. We must consider the redevelopment of large areas of the blighted and slum sections of our cities, so that in a truly American way they may be remade to accommodate families not only of low-income groups as heretofore, but every income group. It was an all-out, comprehensive statement of progressive philosophy, and a sweeping liberal program of action that Truman had begun work on, dictating his thoughts to Sam Rosenman on board the Augusta returning from Potsdam, and that he had since put in a full ten days of concentrated effort on adding new sections, editing, and revising. He had no wish to wait for his State of the Union address to present his domestic program, nor did he intend to go to Congress with it on a piecemeal basis. He wanted one big message. And as time would tell, its significance was enormous, setting his domestic program on a liberal path at the very start. It was one thing to have voted for this kind of program in the Senate when he was following the head of his party. Rosenman told him, "It was quite another to be the head of the party and recommend and fight for it." For those Republicans and conservative Democrats who had been happily claiming that the New Deal was as good as dead. That the Roosevelt nonsense was over at last because they knew Harry Truman. It was a rude awakening. Not even FDR had ever asked for so much at one sitting. Complained House Minority Leader Joe Martin, and many of Truman's own party in Congress were equally distressed, equally disinclined to go along with him. The same conservative coalition of Republicans and Southern Democrats that had stymied Roosevelt since 1937 stood ready now to block his successor. The House Ways and Means Committee, with fourteen Democrats and ten Republicans, voted to reject the unemployment compensation proposal and shelved any further consideration of aid to the jobless. As the newspapers were saying, Truman's anticipated six-month waltz with Congress was over before it began. Labor leaders demanded an end to wage controls, but a hold on prices. Business leaders demanded the opposite. Nobody wanted more inflation of the kind the war had brought. Yet, while most everyday commodities were in short supply, nearly everyone seemed to have money to spend. Billions of dollars put aside in war bonds and savings accounts. Meanwhile, the Pentagon rushed to cancel billions of dollars in war contracts, fifteen billion dollars in less than a month. Boeing aircraft laid off twenty-one thousand workers. Ford laid off fifty thousand at the very moment when hundreds of thousands of soldiers were pouring home, expecting to find jobs. Fully twelve million men and women were in uniform and hoping to return to normal life. As soon as possible.
Prophecies of economic doom had become commonplace. His own downfall as a post-World War I haberdasher vivid in memory, Truman reminded Congress of what the country had experienced then. We found ourselves in one of the worst inflations in our history, culminating in the crash of 1920 and 1921. We must be sure this time not to repeat that bitter mistake. Worse by far and closer to mind was the Great Depression, which had never really ended by 1939, when the war began in Europe. If the end of the war truly meant a return to what had been normal before the war, then the prospect was grim indeed. As everyone knew, the nation had thrived on the war. Production of goods and services in 1945 was more than twice what it had been in 1939. The cost of living was up by some 30 percent, the income of the average worker had also doubled, and unemployment was less than 2 percent, an unbelievable figure. Farm income was five times what it had been when Truman was running the farm at Grandview. Never had Americans known such prosperity. Yet the certainty that hard times would return was also widespread and deeply ingrained. For a whole generation of Americans, fear of another depression would never go away. It was coming as sure as God made little green apples, fathers warned their families at the dinner table, and next time it would be bad enough to curl your hair. Nor were the supposed experts any less pessimistic. In his report to the President at a cabinet meeting on October 19th, Secretary of Commerce Henry Wallace estimated that the drop in the gross national product in the coming months would be $40 billion, the drop in wages $20 billion, which by spring could mean 7 or 8 million unemployed. 1939 all over again. Even had there been time to plan and prepare, even if it had been possible to ignore the clamor to bring the boys home and demobilize in a slower, more orderly fashion, the problems of reconversion would have been staggering. As it was, sudden peace had caught the country almost as ill-prepared as had sudden war. A populace that had been willing to accept shortages and inconveniences, ceilings on wages and inadequate housing since 1941 because there was a war on, seemed desperate to make up for lost time, demanding everything at once. By October, the country was facing the biggest housing shortage in history. In Chicago alone, reportedly, there were 100,000 homeless veterans. The city of Chicago would shortly offer old streetcars for sale for conversion into homes. Among the letters pouring into the White House was one from a man in Los Angeles who told of meeting a homeless veteran, a medical sergeant, his pregnant wife and small child, and described how he had taken them in for the night because they had no place to go. Do something, the writer urged the president. Labor unions, free of their wartime pledges not to strike, called for catch-up pay hikes. Strikes broke out in nearly every industry. In New York, 15,000 elevator operators went out. Elsewhere, 27,000 oil workers and 60,000 lumber workers walked off their jobs. In Washington, meantime, new dealers were leaving the government in droves. For Truman, all this was extremely difficult to understand. He knew relatively little of economics, and the economics of Reconstruction were complicated. He failed to comprehend how a people who had shown such dedication and will through the war could overnight become so rampantly selfish and disinterested in the common good. The Congress are balking, labor has gone crazy, and management isn't far from insane in selfishness, he reported to his mother, who in her small frame house in Grandview remained an indispensable sounding board. He believed as ever in the ancient Republican ideals of citizenship, Cincinnatus, the legendary Roman warrior who, after saving his country, laid down his arms and returned to the farm, remained a personal hero. As he liked to point out to visitors, he had replaced the model cannon on his desk with a shiny model plow. His response was to work harder than ever, as if by keeping a fuller, busier schedule, moving faster, seeing more people, traveling more, he could at least set an example. On one not untypical morning, he saw more than a dozen visitors in two hours, including Congressman Albert Gore of Tennessee, who brought him a bottle of Jack Daniels, Senator Wheeler, his old Truman Committee aide Max Lowenthal, the governor of the Virgin Islands, another congressman, Pat Cannon of Florida, who wanted to talk about hurricane damage, the young Democratic mayor of Minneapolis, Hubert Humphrey, and his wife, and a group of women sponsoring an Equal Rights Amendment. A lot of hooey about equal rights, Truman noted on his appointment sheet as the last of these went out the door. He zipped through work in what one account called the decisive style that is now recognized as typically Truman. He made changes with hurried strokes of the pen, seldom anything earth-shaking, but everything brisk. 
At one press conference, he took all of five minutes to announce that he was reorganizing the Labor Department, transferring authority over the Office of Economic Stabilization to the Office of War Mobilization and Reconversion under John Snyder, appointing Stuart Symington of St. Louis to a new Surplus Property Administration, accepting the resignation of Secretary of War Stimson, appointing Undersecretary Robert Patterson as Stimson's replacement, and naming Senator Harold H. Burton of Ohio to the Supreme Court. "'Anything else, Mr. President?' asked a reporter, and the room erupted with laughter. He greatly enjoyed such moments. He loved rewarding a loyal old friend like Snyder with the prestige and power of an important job. It was among the prime satisfactions of the successful politician's life, not to say what was expected of him as a good Jacksonian Democrat. He had always taken care of his own with jobs large and small as best he could. He had hated firing Eddie McKim and eventually arranged a vague job for him with the Rural Finance Commission. When Jake Vardaman, the naval aide, began flaunting his supposed authority beyond bounds, irritating too many people at the White House, including Bess Truman, and Vardaman too had to be eased out, Truman put him on the Federal Reserve Board, a position for which Vardaman was plainly ill-suited. Even former Senator Bennett Clark of Missouri, who had so often made life difficult for him over the years, was not forgotten. On September 12th, Truman made Clark an associate justice of the U.S. Court of Appeals in Washington, and shortly afterward, when Clark was remarried in the little northern Virginia town of Berryville, Truman stood beside him as best man, something he had never done before. Two official ceremonial duties that fall moved him deeply, which made both occasions especially memorable. Before a small, sunny gathering in the Rose Garden on September 21st, the day of Henry Stimson's retirement, Truman presented the elderly Secretary of War with the Distinguished Service Medal and did so with great simple dignity. As his staff had come to appreciate, it was at such occasions that Truman excelled. He was at his best with small groups, close up and entirely himself, yet keenly aware of the meaning of the occasion. It was Stimson's 78th birthday and his last day in Washington. If anyone in the government was entitled to one, a medal, it is that good man, Truman wrote to Bess, who was back in Independence. In November, in the courtyard at the Pentagon, at another no less moving farewell, this for General Marshall, Truman again presented the Distinguished Service Medal, which was the General's only American military decoration of the war. Marshall had refused repeatedly to accept any such honors, saying it would be improper for him while men were dying overseas. To Truman, Marshall, more than any other man, had been responsible for winning the war, and he spoke now of Marshall as a tower of strength to two presidents. He takes his place at the head of the great commanders of history, Truman said, clearly meaning that exactly. Later, Truman said there wasn't a decoration big enough for General Marshall. But such occasions were rare. More often he was feeling close to despair over how much needed to be done and how little real say he had, how little time there was ever to focus on any one problem. The strain began to tell. The pressure here, he told his mother, is becoming so great I hardly get my meals in, let alone do what I want to do. His speaking trips around the country, intended as a way to bring his message to the people, too often resulted in adverse publicity that was seen as his own doing. At the American Legion Fair at Carothersville, Missouri, talking of the difficulties to be faced, he spoke seriously and thoughtfully of the atomic bomb. He had asked Congress for the establishment of a new Atomic Energy Commission under civilian, not military control, saying, The release of atomic energy constitutes a new force too revolutionary to consider in the framework of old ideas. Sounding like the naive Mr. Smith in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, he told the crowd that the way to get along in the world was to apply the golden rule. We can't stand another global war. We can't ever have another war unless it is total war, and that means the end of our civilization as we know it. We are not going to do that. We are going to accept that golden rule, and we are going forward to meet our destiny, which I think Almighty God intended us to have. But at Carothersville, in the cotton country of Missouri's southeastern boot heel, he also paused on a morning walk to spit in the Mississippi River, an old local right, he explained to astonished reporters. He played the piano in the little hotel dining room, held open court in a drugstore, went to the races, signed autographs on napkins and blank checks, posed with legionnaires on a mock locomotive, rang the bell, did everything, said the Washington Post, except have himself shot from the mouth of a cannon. At a conference of several hundred Democratic congressmen and senators at a clubhouse on Jefferson Island in Chesapeake Bay, he encouraged everyone to call him Harry and joined a game of stud poker on the porch.
An unnamed senator later reported that Harry Truman played a damn good game, while another eyewitness, also unnamed, describing what a good time everyone had, said, There was all we could eat and more than we could drink. Only two people passed out. The word cronies appeared with increasing frequency to depict the president's friends and associates. Harry Vaughan, his sudden eminence obviously having gone to his head, began holding his own press conferences and making speeches. Vaughan boasted of how at Potsdam he had sold a $55 watch to a Russian for $500, and in a talk before a group of Presbyterian women in Virginia, in an attempt to explain the difference between Presidents Roosevelt and Truman, said that after a diet of caviar the country was ready for ham and eggs. Several of the presidential staff grew concerned over the mounting confusion at the White House. Budget Director Harold Smith judged Truman to be a man of fine, keen intelligence, but regrettably disorganized. At a staff meeting in mid-October, Truman himself admitted to being in the doldrums over how things were going. He would cut back on his appointments, he said, cancel some trips. News that delighted everyone, wrote Eben Ayers, the assistant press secretary, who worried especially over stories about Harry Vaughan and poker games and drinking, certain that sooner or later they would bring trouble. An unobtrusive, soft-spoken man who was known among the White House press as Mumbles, Ayers was secretly keeping a diary that would one day provide an invaluable inside record of the Truman years. Outwardly, Truman appeared unchanged. Reporters described him as chipper, affable, jaunty, looking rested, fresh, and bouncy. Looking always, wrote columnist Westbrook Pegler, like his old ma just dressed him up and slicked his hair for the strawberry social. And he was still exceptionally popular, his approval rating at about 80%. If Congress balked at his requests, he just asked for more. There was nothing unusual about a president being rebuffed by Congress. What was novel was a president who, when repeatedly rebuffed, refused to change his tactics. He asked for national compulsory health insurance to be funded by payroll deductions. Under the system, all citizens would receive medical and hospital service irrespective of their ability to pay. And with the cry for demobilization at a peak, he went before a joint session to call for universal military training, an idea that stood no chance, but that he believed in fervently. We must face the fact that peace must be built upon power as well as upon goodwill and good deeds. Never again could the country count on the luxury of time to arm itself. He wanted mandatory training for one year for all young men between 18 and 20, not as members of the armed services, but as citizens who would comprise a trained reserve, ready in case of emergency. One morning, standing at his desk, he presented to the press a new presidential flag, telling Harry Vaughan to hold it high enough so that everyone could see. This new flag faces the eagle toward the staff, Truman explained, which is looking to the front all the time when you are on the march, and also has him looking at the olive branch for peace instead of the arrows for war. Both the flag and presidential seal had been redesigned for the first time since the Wilson years, and Truman meant the shift in the eagle's gaze to be seen as symbolic of a nation both on the march and dedicated to peace. On October 26th, he went to New York to the Brooklyn Navy Yard to commission a huge new aircraft carrier, the USS Franklin D. Roosevelt. Later, from the deck of the battleship Missouri, he reviewed a line of fifty warships in the Hudson River, while overhead flew twelve hundred Navy planes. The Eagle had never held such arrows. It was a spectacle of national power such as no commander-in-chief had ever beheld, and it was all rapidly dissolving. Had he tried then, in these last days of 1945, to halt the pell-mell demobilization underway and keep American fighting forces intact, he might have been impeached, so overwhelming was the country's desire for a return of its young men and women now that the war was won, the enemy crushed. It wasn't demobilization at all, he later remarked. It was disintegration. Riding in a caravan to Central Park to deliver a Navy Day speech, the first presidential address to be broadcast on television, he was cheered by tremendous crowds, three to five million people at least. Mayor Fiorella LaGuardia told Truman and Admiral Leahy as they waved from the open car. To Leahy, it was a triumphal procession such as no Roman emperor could have dreamed of. Yet the press was already judging Truman only fair at his job. He was faulted for dealing with large issues in a small-scale way, for too often muddling through while banking on an apparently irrepressible and often expressed belief that everything will always work itself out. The labor situation grew steadily worse. Picket lines became an established sign of the times, and Truman wavered, 
In seeming support of labor, he called for reasonable pay raises through collective bargaining. Then, under pressure from both Democrats and Republicans to get tough with the unions, he asked Congress to forbid strikes in large national industries for 30 days until the situation could be appraised by a fact-finding board, an idea that pleased neither labor nor management nor Congress. In the meantime, 175,000 employees of General Motors, workers in plants in 19 states, walked out in a strike that would last more than three months. His was a thankless job, Truman told the writer John Gunther, who had not seen him since he was vice president and was struck by the change. Tiny lines had grown around his mouth, Gunther wrote. He looked tired, perplexed, and annoyed. On another day, Robert Oppenheimer came to see him privately and, in a state of obvious agitation, said he had blood on his hands because of his work on the bomb. For Truman, it was a dreadful moment. Oppenheimer's self-pitying, crybaby attitude was abhorrent. The blood is on my hands, he told Oppenheimer. Let me worry about that. Afterward, he said he hoped he would not have to see the man ever again. In November, the American ambassador to China, Patrick J. Hurley, who had returned to Washington for consultation, announced unexpectedly that he was resigning because of the way the State Department was siding with the Chinese communists. Hurley broke the news in a speech at the press club barely an hour after telling Truman that all was under control in China and that he would be returning there shortly. To me, this was an utterly inexplicable about-face, and what had caused it I cannot imagine even yet, Truman would write years later. At the time, he was more explicit. Tearing a yellow news copy from the White House ticker, he stormed into a cabinet meeting, saying, See what a son of a bitch did to me? Clinton Anderson, the Secretary of Agriculture, suggested that the President immediately name General Marshall as the new special ambassador to China, and thus take the headlines away from Hurley. It was an inspired suggestion. From the Red Room, Truman telephoned Marshall at his home in Leesburg, Virginia. "'General, I want you to go to China for me,' he said. "'Yes, Mr. President,' Marshall replied, and hung up. Truman had hated to make the call. Marshall by then had had all of six days of retirement. Marshall said later that he had ended the call abruptly because his wife walked into the room and he wished to explain to her himself, rather than have her overhear a telephone conversation." At a gridiron club dinner in December, only half in jest, Truman declared that General William Tecumseh Sherman had been wrong. I'm telling you, I find peace is hell. His health insurance plan was getting nowhere. Another message, and of equal importance to Truman, called for unification of the armed forces under a single Secretary of Defense, an idea the Navy vehemently opposed and that Bob Hannigan thought politically unwise, arguing that it was foolish ever to wage an unnecessary fight that he might lose. But Truman insisted. He wanted to break up the power of the West Point and Annapolis cliques to make the armed services more democratic, a noble aspiration, many around him agreed, but impossible, they felt. It was his duty to send the message, he said, because it represented his conviction. To Sam Rosenman, who had grown immensely fond of Truman, the chief difference between Truman and Roosevelt was that Truman paid much less attention to what his actions were doing towards his chances for re-election. Truman did a great many things that Roosevelt, because he knew the effect it would have, never would have done. To many it appeared that the President's easy familiarity with members of Congress, their talk of good old Harry and so forth, was proving a handicap. If his program was steadfastly in the Roosevelt tradition, they could be quite as obdurate as they had been with Roosevelt just before the war, only now without the fear that, like Roosevelt, Truman might take his case to the country with powerful effect. Truman couldn't awe them, and as was said, in American politics, a fearsome respect usually achieved better results than camaraderie. Meantime, privately, Truman felt that Jimmy Burns, who was in Moscow at a foreign minister's conference, was failing to keep him sufficiently informed. To Henry Wallace, he expressed concern that the peacetime use of atomic energy might so reduce the length of the working day that people would get into mischief. Once at a cabinet meeting in December, Wallace politely but pointedly lectured him for not knowing how many atomic bombs were in stock, and for saying further that he really didn't want to know. Mr. President, you should know, Wallace insisted. The President retreated in some confusion and said he guessed he should know, and then covered up by saying, I do know in a general way, Wallace noted in his diary. From Burns and Wallace both, Truman got the distinct impression that each thought his own judgment considerably superior to that of the President. To many of the holdovers from the Roosevelt years, as to prominent liberals everywhere, it appeared the administration was going to pieces. In the stridently liberal New York newspaper PM, 
Columnist Max Lerner offered a scathing assessment of the president, calling him one of history's wild accidents. There had been leaders in the past who had greatness thrust upon them by circumstance, but never one who wore the mantle of great office so uneasily, wrote Lerner, who had been to Missouri and felt he now understood Truman's strengths and defects. The president's first quality was personal honesty. He was also loyal to his friends and a hard worker. The overriding problem, said Lerner, was his middle-class mentality. In a crisis, the middle-class mind falls back on personal virtues and personal relations. In a crisis, the middle-class mind shows itself more fearful of labor and strikes and labor's political power than of anything else. In a crisis, the middle-class mind tries to assume a lofty detachment from the deep issues of the day and tries to blink the real social cleavage and struggles. These struggles are not reconcilable by a personal appeal for cooperation. In the end, you have to choose your side and fight on it. In the end, President Truman's basic weakness lies in his failure to understand imaginatively the nature and greatness of the office he holds. Though Bess, Margaret, and Madge Wallace departed for independence a week before Christmas, Truman remained at the White House until Christmas morning when he decided to fly home despite dreadful weather. The first snow of winter had fallen on Washington two weeks earlier. On the 19th, another five inches fell in a storm that hit much of the country. Christmas morning, he awoke to a driving wind, sleet, and rain. National Airport was sheathed in ice, he was told. All commercial flights were canceled. But after conferring with his pilot, Lieutenant Colonel Hank Myers, Truman decided to go, and when the sacred cow at last appeared out of the clouds over Kansas City, it was more than an hour overdue. Newspapers and radio commentators called the trip foolhardy, one of the most hazardous sentimental journeys ever undertaken by a chief of state, said the New York Times. Had anyone known the sort of welcome he received on reaching the big gray house on North Delaware Street, the journey would have seemed even more unnecessary, his position still more pathetic. For Bess had been anything but sentimental or approving. At his desk in Washington three days later, Truman would write one of the most forlorn letters of his life. December 28, 1945 Dear Bess, Well, I'm here in the White House, the great white sepulchre of ambitions and reputations. I feel like last year's bird's nest, which is on its second year. Not very often, I admit, I am not in shape. I think maybe that exasperates you, too, as a lot of other things I do and pretend to do exasperate you. But it isn't intended for that purpose. You can never appreciate what it means to come home as I did the other evening after doing at least one hundred things I didn't want to do and have the only person in the world whose approval and good opinion I value look at me like I'm something the cat dragged in and tell me I've come in at last because I couldn't find any reason to stay away. I wonder why we are made so that what we really think and feel we cover up. This head of mine should have been bigger and better proportioned. There ought to have been more brain and a larger bump of ego or something to give me an idea that there can be a number one man in the world. I didn't want to be. But in spite of the opinions to the contrary, life and time say I am. He was on the cover of time that week as man of the year. If that is the case, you, Margie, and everyone else who may have any influence on my actions must give me help and assistance because no one ever needed help and assistance as I do now. If I can get the use of the best brains in the country and a little help from those I have on a pedestal at home, the job will be done. Kiss my baby, and I love you in season and out. Harry. But thinking better of it, he never mailed the letter. It was tucked in a desk drawer together with its unused envelope. The grim weather held as he struggled to keep control of events, his chief aggravation now the behavior of his Secretary of State. Before returning from independence, Truman had been notified by Charlie Ross that Burns, in winding up the Moscow conference, had released a communique in advance of any summary report to the President. To make matters worse, Burns, en route home, notified Ross to arrange airtime on all the radio networks so that he could report to the nation before seeing the President. Clearly, Burns had forgotten his manners. Senator Vandenberg, disturbed that Burns had been too conciliatory with the Russians, rushed to the White House demanding to know what was going on. That was on Friday, December 28th, the day of Truman's plaintive letter to Bess. Afterward, he left for a cruise down the Potomac on the presidential yacht, Williamsburg, again disregarding the miserable weather. When Burns landed in Washington the following day, Saturday the 29th, a telegram from Truman was waiting for him. Suggest you come down today or tomorrow to report your mission.' 
We can then discuss, among other things, the advisability of a broadcast by you. The relationship between the two men had never been easy or entirely candid. Burns did indeed consider himself better equipped and more deserving than Truman to be president, and he was not always successful in concealing that. Though Truman considered Burns extremely bright, his experience in government unequaled, he had never felt he could entirely trust him. En route to Potsdam, Truman had referred to him in a diary entry as his able and conniving Secretary of State. My, but he has a keen mind, Truman wrote, and he is honest, but all country politicians are alike. They are sure all other politicians are circuitous in their dealings. After a hurried flight by special plane, Burns went aboard the Williamsburg at Quantico, Virginia, and met with Truman privately in Truman's stateroom. A cold rain was falling on the river. Everything outside was gray and forbidding. By Truman's account, written much later, he closed the door and gave Burns a sharp dressing down. I told him I did not like the way in which I had been left in the dark about the Moscow conference. I told him that as president I intended to know what progress we were making and what we were doing in foreign negotiations. I said that it was shocking that a communique should be issued in Washington announcing a foreign policy development of major importance that I had never heard of. I said I would not tolerate a repetition of such conduct. Burns, however, would insist the conversation was entirely pleasant, and according to others on board, it was not so much Truman as Admiral Leahy who gave Burns a hard time. Leahy, as was known, considered Burns a horse's ass. Dean Atchison, who was not present but who developed an understanding of both Truman and Burns, later speculated that both their impressions were genuine. The Truman, in recalling such encounters, was inclined to exaggerate his bark, when in reality he was nearly always extremely considerate of the feelings of others. And that Burns, as a veteran of South Carolina politics, would never have taken as personal criticism Truman's demand to be kept informed. In any event, the meeting marked a change in the relationship. There was no open break, but Truman's confidence in his Secretary of State was not to be the same again. Six days later, still steaming mad, he wrote a long-hand letter to My Dear Jim, saying that while he wanted to give members of his cabinet ample authority, he had no intention of relinquishing the authority of the President or to forego the President's prerogative to make the final decision. He was intensely concerned about Russia, tired of babying the Soviets. Unless Russia is faced with an iron fist and strong language, another war is in the making. Only one language do they understand. How many divisions have you? According to an account that Truman wrote years later, he then called Burns to his office and read the letter aloud. But again Burns declared that no such scene occurred. If it had, Burns said, he would have resigned at once. But for the record, Truman noted on the letter in his own hand at the time, read to the Secretary of State and discussed, not typed or mailed. Later, in a conversation with Eben Ayers, Truman said he had most definitely read the letter to Burns, right here in this office with him sitting right where you are. I told him I was not going to give him the letter, but wanted to read it to him. Burns's face, said Truman, had turned fiery red. It was a letter like others to come in Truman's presidency. He called them his longhand spasms, and there appears indeed to have been something sudden and involuntary about them. They seemed to serve some deep psychological need, as a vent for his anger, and were seldom intended for anyone to see. They cleared the air for him. He felt better almost immediately, and unsent, they did no one any harm. Yet in tone and content they bore little or no resemblance to the way he was ordinarily with people. I have never heard him say or heard of him saying a harsh, bitter, or sarcastic word to anyone, whatever the offense or failure, Dean Acheson would write. 2. With the new year underway, there was little time for brooding, seldom time enough for anything. A steel strike loomed, threatening the whole economy. Hurried meetings were held. Official cars came and went in the White House Drive. 1946 is our year of decision, Truman had told the country in a radio broadcast. This year we lay the foundation for our economic structure, which will have to serve for generations. The Steelworkers Union, headed by Phil Murray, called for a wage increase of 19 and a half cents an hour. The steel companies, represented by Benjamin Fairless of U.S. Steel, offered 15 cents. At the conclusion of a long, arduous session at the White House on January 12th, Truman was able to announce that Murray had agreed to postpone the strike for one week. After another session on the 17th, and still no agreement, Truman proposed that the steel companies grant an increase of 18 and a half cents. Both sides wanted time to consider, and were told that they had until noon the following day. 
Murray accepted the President's proposal, but Fairless refused. On January 19, 1946, at more than 1,000 mills across the country, 800,000 steelworkers walked off the job in the biggest strike in history. The whole country was in the grip of strikes. Some 200,000 meat packers had struck by now. There was a glass workers' strike, a telephone strike, a coffin makers' strike, a huge strike at General Electric. In Pittsburgh, a strike of 3,500 electric company employees caused plant closings that affected 100,000 other workers. Streetcars stopped running. Office buildings closed. This is a disaster, said Pittsburgh's Mayor David Lawrence in a radio plea to the strikers to go back to their jobs. And Mayor Lawrence, a Democrat, was long considered a solid friend of labor. Pressed for a statement about the steel strike at his next press conference, Truman replied, I personally think there is too much power on each side, and I think it is necessary that the government assert the fact that it is the power of the people. But how would the government assert itself? We are doing everything we possibly can, he answered, giving no one much hope. A week later, he could say only, We have been working on it all the time. No one who had never had the responsibility could possibly understand what it was like to be president, Truman would write later, not even his closest aides or members of his family. There was no end to the chain of responsibility that binds him, and he is never allowed to forget that he is president. Problems and decisions of every conceivable variety wound up on his desk, as did criticism and blame. In the fall, Fred Canfield had given him a small sign for his desk. The buck stops here, it said. Canfield had seen one like it in the head office of a federal reformatory in El Reno, Oklahoma, and asked the warden if a copy might be made for his friend the president, and though Truman kept it on his desk only a short time, the message would stay with him permanently. What sustained him, Truman said, was the belief that there was more good than evil in human beings. Now even that was being put severely to the test. Congress and labor had let him down. Mrs. Roosevelt was telling friends he had the wrong sort of people around him, a theme struck also by colonist Walter Lippmann. The blunt truth, wrote Lippmann, was that the men nearest the president did not have the brains and have practically none of the wisdom from experience and education to help him be president. A cartoon in the arch-conservative Chicago Tribune pictured the president as little Lord Fauntleroy being baited and knocked about by a gang of tough street urchins labeled Labor, Management, Party Radical, Party Conservative, and Foreign Diplomacy. The caption was in verse. Little Truman Fauntleroy, famous as that model boy, always trying to do good in the name of brotherhood, was the leader of his class, temporarily, alas. Look at little Truman now, muddy, battered, bruised, and how, victim of his misplaced trust, he has learned what good boys must. In the alley after school, there just ain't no golden rule. The Saturday Evening Post, which claimed to represent the views and values of middle America, said the Truman administration, after ten months in office, could be labeled, at best, undistinguished. Some Washington journalists, who admired the president's fundamental decency and determination, felt sorry for him. It was a cruel time to put inexperience in power, wrote Richard Rovere. In the new hit movie, The Best Years of Our Lives, which had been written by Roosevelt's former speechwriter, Robert Sherwood, and was to win nine Academy Awards, Actor Frederick March, playing one of the three heroes of the story, three returning veterans of the war, declared bitterly, Last year it was kill Japs, this year it's make money. While at another point his teenage son voiced his fear of the future, of atomic bombs, guided missiles, and everything. People were befuddled and needed time out to get a nerve rest, Truman wrote to his mother. He wouldn't mind going on strike himself, he said. As it was, he was planning a trip to Florida. He had installed a new White House physician, a 35-year-old Army doctor, Colonel Wallace H. Graham, who was the son of the Independence doctor who looked after Mama Truman. Concerned that the president was working too hard, Graham urged a vacation. On Graham's orders, Truman had begun taking a brisk walk of two or three miles every morning before breakfast. Walks, Truman told Charlie Ross, that were helping him sleep better. To replace Henry Stimson as Secretary of War, he had named Robert Patterson, and for Chief of Staff, to replace George Marshall, General Eisenhower, both regarded as excellent appointments. But his choice for a new Undersecretary of the Navy had suddenly blown into storm. Truman had picked Ed Pauley, the California oil man and Democratic money-raiser, who helped engineer his nomination for the Vice Presidency, and who, more recently, 
had been working on reparation problems in Europe and Japan. Truman liked Pauli, thought him tough, straightforward, and capable of getting things done. He intended that Pauli replace Forrestal eventually, then become the first Secretary of Defense once that office was created. I wanted the hardest, meanest son of a bitch I could get, Truman later said. He also knew Roosevelt had been planning to make Pauli the Undersecretary of the Navy, and further that Forrestal approved. But Pauli's business and political background made him an unwise choice, as others at the White House saw at once. An oil man should not be head of the department which has such a vital interest in the conservation of the nation's oil reserve, noted Eben Ayers privately, and a politician should not be at the head of the Navy. The trouble broke when Secretary of the Interior Harold Ickes was called to testify before the Senate Committee on Naval Affairs. On the train returning from Roosevelt's funeral, Ickes revealed, Pauli had had the nerve to question him on Tideland's oil policy, Pauli's very unsubtle implication being that huge campaign contributions would be made available if California's jurisdiction over the Tidelands went uncontested. Truman, when he heard what Ickes had said, was beside himself, for in a meeting with Ickes just prior to Ickes's testimony, Truman had told him that while of course he must speak the truth to the committee, Truman hoped he might also be gentle with Pauli. Truman felt betrayed. Ickes felt he had had no choice but to tell what he knew. Asked by reporters if he would withdraw Pauli's nomination, Truman said he would not. Asked if his relations with Ickes had changed, he said Ickes could be mistaken the same as anyone. Ickes resigned on February 13th, declaring at his own press conference that he had been unable to commit perjury for the sake of the party and that he could not possibly serve in the cabinet any longer and maintain his self-respect. He was against government by crony, Ickes further stated, an expression that would not be forgotten. Outraged that Ickes had implied that he, the president, had asked him to commit perjury, Truman not only accepted the resignation but told Ickes he had three days to clear out. Though Pauli denied under oath that he had ever made any such proposition to Ickes, the appointment was doomed, and once the committee agreed to affirm Pauli's personal integrity, the nomination was withdrawn at his request. The whole affair had been extremely unpleasant, recalling for many people memories of the Harding administration with its Teapot Dome oil scandals. Ickes, celebrated as Honest Herald and the Old Curmudgeon, was incurably hard to deal with, as everyone knew, but he had been an exceptional Secretary of Interior and served longer in the job than anyone. Except for Henry Wallace, Ickes was the last of the new dealers in the Truman cabinet, and his departure, in combination with the bitterness of his parting remarks, was taken by liberals especially as still another extremely discouraging sign. One has the feeling, wrote the New York Post, that a poorer and poorer caste is dealing desperately with a bigger and bigger story. Remembering Ickes years later, Truman would describe him as a chronic resigner. He reminded me of old Salmon P. Chase, who was Secretary of the Treasury in Lincoln's cabinet, and he thought he ought to be president that he'd be a better president than Lincoln, and he was always resigning. He must have resigned a dozen times. Lincoln said someplace that old Chase wasn't happy unless he was unhappy, and that was just about the case with Ickes. I knew he'd turned in his resignation a few times while Roosevelt was president. The whole thing was a great pity because he'd been a good man in his day. The Florida trip was canceled. Truman kept thinking each week that perhaps the next would not be so hectic, he told his staff, but then the next week was always worse. There was always a crisis just around the corner, and he had to do something about it. Many in Washington wondered if this was to be the pattern, taking problems as they came rather than working to achieve large, clear objectives. His popularity was tumbling. From the record high of 87% approval in the months after Roosevelt's death, it had fallen by February to 63%, according to the Gallup poll. Some things of importance had been accomplished— a new Central Intelligence Group was organized, a civilian agency separate from the military and the State Department, to gather and analyze intelligence data for the president. Herbert Hoover was appointed to make a survey of the world food crisis, and an Employment Act had been passed by Congress, a landmark for the Truman administration. Though failing to call for full employment, as Truman wished, it did empower the federal government to use all practical means to foster maximum employment and set up a President's Economic Council, something new, to appraise the economic outlook and consider the effect of government programs on the economy. In addition, Truman had become the first President to recommend statehood for Alaska and Hawaii. His new Secretary of the Interior, to fill Ickes's place, was Julius Krug, who was young and widely respected. Privately, and somewhat bitterly, Truman mused that perhaps he should add some new kitchen cabinet secretaries as well a secretary of inflation to convince everyone that however high or low prices went, it didn't matter.
a secretary of reaction to abolish airplanes and restore ox carts and sailing ships, a secretary of columnists to read all the columns and report to the president on how the country should be run, and a secretary of semantics to supply big words as well as to tell him when to keep quiet. The trouble with the president, it was being said, was not that he spoke his mind too often or too candidly, but that he wanted too much to please, to get along with everybody, agree with everybody. It was an approach that might serve in the Senate, but not in the executive office. In an article titled, Every Man in the White House, Kenneth G. Crawford wrote in the American Mercury that while Truman was proof of the great American myth that anyone could become president, he was a flat disappointment, essentially indecisive, essentially vacillating, too ready to see two sides to every argument. He does so like to agree with whoever is with him at the moment, wrote Henry Wallace, who as Secretary of Commerce had been seeing more of Truman than usual during the labor strife. Wallace's principal worry was American policy concerning the Soviet Union, expressing his views privately with Truman, arguing that every effort must be made to get along with the Soviets. Wallace found that Truman invariably agreed with him. Yet Wallace knew the contrary views the president was receiving from people like Harriman and Leahy, and felt sure that in private Truman agreed with them too. Leahy, for his part, saw Burns and others at the State Department as too ready to accommodate the Russians. He worried that appeasement would lead to war, as at Munich. In his diary in late February, Leahy recorded that the president appears to consider it necessary to adopt a strong diplomatic opposition to the Soviet program of expansion. In fact, Truman was not of one mind regarding the Soviets, any more than official Washington was, or the country. He did truly wish to get along with the Russians quite as much as did Wallace, and, like Leahy, he was steadfastly against appeasement, nor did he see why he should consider such attitudes contradictory. He had no clear policy or long-range objectives— he was facing events only as they came, trying to be patient, trying to be prudent and maintain balance, but at bottom he had no intention of being either belligerent or weak. Then, in a rare public address in Moscow on February 9th, Stalin declared that communism and capitalism were incompatible and that another war was inevitable. He called for increased production in a new five-year plan to guarantee our country against any eventuality. Production of materials for national defense were to be tripled. Consumer goods, Stalin said, must wait on rearmament. Confrontation with the capitalist West, he predicted, would come in the 1950s, when America would be in the depths of another depression. Washington was stunned. Even the liberal Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas called it the Declaration of World War III. Since Stalin had decided to make military power his objective, wrote Walter Lippmann, the United States was left with no choice but to do the same. The Red Army was still in Manchuria. The Russian garrison in Iran's northernmost province, Azerbaijan, was still in place, in disregard of an agreement that it would be withdrawn within six months of the German surrender. On February 16th, just a week after the Stalin speech, came the sensational news from Ottawa that a spy ring had been uncovered and charged with trying to steal information on the atomic bomb for the Russians, and the ring included a member of the Canadian Parliament. But nothing so highlighted Truman's ambivalence about relations with the Soviets as events surrounding the speech given by Winston Churchill at Fulton, Missouri, in the first week of March 1946, a speech Truman had encouraged and that he knew about in advance and approved of, despite what he later said. Located twenty miles north of Jefferson City in rolling farmland, the little town of Fulton was the site of tiny Westminster College, a Presbyterian men's school where Harry Vaughan had once played center on the football team. The idea to invite Churchill to speak there had been the inspiration of Dr. Frank L. McClure, president of the college. McClure had traveled to Washington to see Vaughn, who took him in to meet the boss. Truman was immediately enthusiastic and penned a postscript to Churchill at the bottom of the invitation. This is a wonderful school in my home state. Hope you can do it. I'll introduce you. Best regards. In reply, Churchill told Truman, Under your auspices, anything I say will command some attention. In February, while vacationing in Florida, Churchill made a flying visit to Washington to talk with Truman about the speech. The subject will be the necessity for full military collaboration between Great Britain and the U.S. in order to preserve peace in the world, Admiral Leahy recorded. On March 3rd, returning again to Washington from Florida, Churchill conferred still further with Leahy, this time at the British Embassy, where, propped up in bed, puffing on a huge cigar, Churchill kept scattering ashes over the manuscript pages strewn about him. Leahy found no fault in the speech.
The following day, Monday, March 4th, riding in Roosevelt's armored railroad car, the Ferdinand Magellan, Truman and Churchill left by special train for Missouri, accompanied by Leahy, Vaughn, Charlie Ross, Colonel Graham, and a half-dozen others from the White House staff, plus forty-three reporters and photographers. Truman's obvious high spirits impressed everyone. He was delighted to be traveling in such good company and bringing Churchill, the most famous speaker in the world, to a college in his home state that no one ever heard of. His mood was infectious. Churchill recited Whittier's Barbara Fritchie and drank five scotches before dinner. Mr. President, Churchill said later at the card table, I think that when we are playing poker, I will call you Harry. All right, Winston, Truman replied. As the evening passed, feigning ignorance of the game, Churchill would remark to the great amusement of the others, Harry, what does a sequence count? Or, Harry, I think I'll risk a shilling on a couple of knaves. He took a boy's delight in the game, wrote Charlie Ross. He couldn't seem to get the hang of the joker as a wild card for aces, straights, and flushes, and so at his suggestion we made the joker completely wild. We played straight poker. The president and the rest of us would have liked to introduce some wild games, but the prime minister thought this would be too confusing. Colonel Graham was the principal winner. About two-thirty in the morning, in the middle of a hand, Churchill put down his cards and said wistfully that if he were born again, he would wish to live in the United States, though he deplored a few of its customs. Which customs did he have in mind, the others asked. You stop drinking with your meals, he said. The next morning, Tuesday, March 5th, as the train raced along the banks of the Missouri River, Churchill made a few final changes in his speech, which was then mimeographed for distribution on board. It was, he said, the most important speech of his career. Truman, having read his copy, told Churchill it would do nothing but good, and surely make a stir. Pointing to the President's seal on the wall of the car, Truman explained that he had had the eagle's head turned to face the olive branch. Churchill said he thought the eagle's head should be on a swivel. The setting and reception at Fulton were all Truman could have wished for. The day was sunny, the temperature in the high sixties, the little town spruced up and looking exactly as he liked to think of Missouri. This was the America he knew best and that he wanted Churchill to see. Thousands of people, many in from the surrounding country, were waiting to cheer them as their motorcade rolled down the red brick main thoroughfare. At a corner near the college, on the curbstone, sat a delegation of elderly gentlemen with old-fashioned high-topped shoes and canes, who waved colored balloons, and standing behind them were several sailors in uniform. The Westminster campus, like the town, was decked with both British and American flags. Following lunch at the home of President McClure, an academic procession started for the gymnasium, Churchill conspicuous in the scarlet robes and plush black cap of Oxford. In his introduction, Truman said he had never met either Churchill or Stalin until Potsdam, and that he became fond of both. Then, calling Churchill one of the outstanding men of the ages, he said, I know he will have something constructive to say to the world. It was a great honor, perhaps almost unique, Churchill began, for a private visitor to be introduced to an academic audience by the President of the United States. Amid his heavy burdens, duties, and responsibilities, unsought but not recoiled from, the President traveled a thousand miles to dignify and magnify our meeting here today, and to give me an opportunity of addressing this kindred nation, as well as my own countrymen across the ocean, and perhaps some other countries too. The President has told you that it is his wish, as I am sure it is yours, that I should have full liberty to give my true and faithful counsel in these anxious and baffling times. I shall certainly avail myself of this freedom. He had, he said, high regard for the Russian people and for his wartime comrade, Marshal Stalin. We welcome Russia to her rightful place among the leading nations of the world. We welcome her flag upon the seas. Above all, we welcome constant, frequent, and growing contacts between the Russian people and our own people on both sides of the Atlantic. Still, it was his duty, Churchill said, to present certain facts. And thus he launched into that part of the speech that was to cause a sensation, giving his own kind of glowering, dramatic emphasis to the indisputable fact that an iron curtain had descended in Eastern Europe. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain had descended across the continent. Behind that line lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe. Warsaw, Berlin, Prague, Vienna, Budapest, Belgrade, Bucharest, and Sofia. All these famous cities and the populations around them lie in what I must call the Soviet sphere, and all are subject in one form or another, not only to Soviet influence, 
but to a very high and in many cases increasing measure of control from Moscow. The Soviets did not want war, but rather the fruits of war, and the indefinite expansion of their power and doctrine. What was needed in response was a union of the Western democracies, specifically an English-speaking union of Britain and the United States. For he knew the Russians, and there was nothing they so admired as strength, nothing for which they had less respect than weakness, and military weakness most of all. From the expression on Truman's face, his applause at several points, it was obvious he approved, as did the audience. The immediate reaction in the country, however, was strongly in opposition. Editorials accused Churchill of poisoning the already difficult relations between the United States and Russia. America had no need for alliances with any other nation, said the Wall Street Journal. Truman declared the nation had been remarkably inept in ever associating himself with the occasion. To Walter Lippmann, the speech was an almost catastrophic blunder. In Moscow, Stalin said it was a call to war with the Soviet Union. Truman was stunned by the criticism. Returning to Washington, he quickly backed off from responsibility, telling reporters he never knew what Churchill was going to say. It was a free country, he added. Churchill had had every right to speak as he pleased. To Henry Wallace, Truman was equally disingenuous, insisting he had never seen the speech in advance and that Churchill had put me on the spot. When reporters pressed him for his opinion of the speech, now that he had had time to think about it, Truman lamely pleaded no comment. To placate Stalin, he wrote a letter offering to send the Missouri to bring him to the United States and promising to accompany him to the University of Missouri so that he too might speak his mind, as Churchill had. But Stalin declined the invitation. It was a bad time for Truman. To the press and an increasing proportion of the country, he seemed bewildered and equivocating, incapable of a clear or positive policy toward the Russians. Nor did the situation appear any more focused to those in the administration who were supposedly in the know. At the same time he was disavowing Churchill's speech, he was also telling Averill Harriman that the refusal of the Soviets to withdraw from Iran could mean war. Harriman, who had quit the Moscow embassy and was now, at Truman's urging, to become ambassador to Great Britain, approved wholeheartedly of what Churchill had said, as did Leahy, Forrestal, and Dean Acheson, all of whom, like Harriman, would have welcomed a strong endorsement by the president, and blamed Burns, whom they saw as too much the compromising politician in his dealings with the Soviets. In an 8,000-word message from the Moscow embassy that was to become known as the Long Telegram, George Kennan, the scholarly chargé d'affaires, had tried to dash any hopes the administration might have of reasonable dealings with the Stalin regime. The Kremlin, wrote Kennan, had a neurotic view of the world, at the heart of which was an age-old Russian sense of insecurity. For this reason, the Soviet regime was committed fanatically to the idea that in the long run there could be no peaceful coexistence with the United States, and further that it is desirable and necessary that the internal harmony of our society be disrupted, our traditional way of life destroyed, the international authority of our state broken. Stripped of the fig leaf of Marxism, Kennan said, the Soviets would stand before history as only the last of a long succession of cruel and wasteful Russian rulers who have relentlessly forced their country on to ever new heights of military power in order to guarantee external security for their internally weak regimes. But Soviet power, he stressed, was highly sensitive to the logic of force, and for this reason, usually backed off when faced with strength. The message had been received at the State Department in February, two weeks before the Churchill speech. Harriman sent a copy to Forrestal, who thought Kennan's thesis so important. He had it mimeographed and circulated through the entire administration, to virtually anyone who had anything to do with foreign and military affairs. Truman, too, read it. But though its long-range influence would be considerable, it was not the immediately galvanizing document sometimes portrayed, not at the White House. On Truman in particular, it does not appear to have had any profound or immediate effect, and most likely for the reason that he had heard much the same case made by Harriman, with his talk of a barbarian invasion of Europe, at their first meeting the year before. In any event, for attribution, he was taking no stand one way or the other. At a cabinet meeting on March 22nd, Truman expressed surprise over the fact that the Navy was inviting some 60 members of Congress to witness the series of atomic bomb tests scheduled to be held soon on the tiny Pacific atoll of Bikini. He didn't care how many went after July 1st, Truman said, but until then Congress had business to attend. Burns questioned the wisdom of such tests, calling them extremely ill-advised at this time and warning of detrimental effect on relations with the Soviets. Vice Admiral William Blandy, who was in charge of the operation, reported that 37,000 men were already assigned to take part. When Truman said a decision was needed here and now, 
Burns declared he would prefer no tests, but that later would be better. Wallace concurred. Truman said that if the tests were canceled, one hundred million dollars would be wasted. He decided the tests would be put off until summer. The next night, Charlie Ross went to the president's private quarters at the White House to see Truman about a statement announcing the postponement. He was in his study working. Mrs. Truman was away, and he was waiting for Margaret to come in, wrote Ross. We had a drink together. He seemed lonesome. To Ross, in confidence, Truman said he was less worried about Russia than were most other people. When reporters questioned whether he shared Harriman's view of the Russian threat, Truman replied, I have nothing to say about it. The easy camaraderie of his earlier press conferences had given way to an atmosphere of greater caution and tension. His sister Mary Jane, who had delighted in sitting in on several of his sessions with reporters during her stay at the White House the previous year, would describe how the questions then had come thick and fast. To her it was a wonder that Harry could answer so quickly. It just didn't seem to me that they gave him any time at all, she said, and all of them got a big bang out of it. Everybody had seemed to be enjoying every moment. Once in a while he got a kind of a smarty question, she remembered, but he had just as smarty an answer. Now the smarty answers were to be avoided. Increasingly at press conferences, on the advice of Ross and others on the staff, Truman's response was no comment, or your guess is as good as mine, or I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. On April 1st, April Fool's Day, John L. Lewis of the United Mine Workers called a nationwide coal strike. For hundreds of thousands of miners, Lewis was a leader such as had only been dreamed of in years past. As he once told them, I have pleaded your case not in the quavering tones of a mendicant asking alms, but in the thundering voice of the captain of a mighty host, demanding the rights to which free men are entitled. Understandably, their loyalty to him was unswerving. If he said it was time to strike, they struck and in the weeks following, on the anniversary of Truman's first year in office, a flurry of newspaper and magazine articles appeared, appraising his performance as president to date. Truman, who still began the day with four or five morning papers, and regularly saw a half-dozen different magazines, probably read them all. The Saturday Evening Post said charitably that perhaps every president had to learn the hard way. Truman might have added that that was about the only way he had ever learned anything in his life. To reporters Bert Andrews and Jack Steele, writing in the New York Herald Tribune, the central question was whether the president would grow in office. New dealers are still unhappy, conservatives are critical, middle of the roaders uncertain. They still find it impossible to decide which way Truman is going. Noel F. Bush, in an article in Life, noted a curious quality to be observed often again as time passed. Showing visitors about the presidential yacht, Truman would point out the lounge, the galley, and guest rooms then say, and this is the president's suite, as though the president were not aboard and he himself were merely an aide or guide. Such remarks, wrote Bush, may serve as evidence of tact or humility, or both. Taken in conjunction with many other traits of speech and behavior on Truman's part, they also show a curious reluctance or even inability to think of himself as president without a conscious effort of will. To the editors of Life's more overtly Republican sister publication, Time, it was by now quite clear that Truman was a mediocre man, the job too big for him. A current Washington wisecrack was, I'm just mild about Harry. Truman, went another joke, was the weakest president since Pierce. What did Pierce ever do? The listener was supposed to ask. That's the point, the teller would exclaim. To Mrs. Robert A. Taft, wife of the conservative Republican senator from Ohio, was attributed the line, To err is Truman. Some observers, however, were not so quick to dismiss him. Here is to be seen no flaming leadership, wrote Arthur Crock, chief Washington correspondent for the New York Times. Little of what could be called scholarship and no more that is profound. But it is very good and human and courageous. Common sense shines out. 3. Even without the coal strike, it had become the longest, most costly siege of labor trouble in the nation's history. At one point, more than a million workers were out on strike, and though the most crippling shutdown thus far in the steel industry was by now settled, the solution had been to grant not just higher wages, but an increase in steel prices, all of which was certain to spur further inflation. Nor had its settlement of the steel strike done anything to improve the standing of the administration. Truman's offer of an eighteen-and-a-half-cent increase to the steel workers' hourly wage had been made without even waiting for his own fact-finding board to report. So now an eighteen-and-a-half-cent raise was what everyone wanted. The General Motors strike dragged on, 
From the day John L. Lewis pulled his men out of the mines, every major industry was affected. Without coal, the steel plants were again banking their furnaces. Ford and Chrysler were forced to close. Freight loadings were off 75 percent. In Chicago, the use of electricity was ordered cut by half. The issue this time with Lewis was a proposed miners' welfare fund to be financed by a five-cent royalty on every ton of coal produced. But Truman detested the hulking Lewis, remembering his bluster and arrogance before the Truman Committee and the strikes he had called during the war. Privately, Truman thought Roosevelt would have been justified if he had had Lewis shot as a traitor. When Truman announced his concern over the legality of the proposed welfare fund, Lewis answered, What does Truman know about the legality of anything? Yet more worrisome still was the mounting threat of a nationwide railroad strike, a calamity no one seemed able to face or forestall, and which, when it came, revealed more about Harry Truman than all but a few episodes in his entire presidency. His public statements were models of restraint. On the surface, he was all restraint, unrattled, entirely his familiar, chipper self, the double-breasted suits smoothly pressed, shoes shined, a spring to his step, a look of alert vitality behind the thick glasses. He had time still for streams of visitors, the customers, he called them, time always to praise or thank those on the staff who had put in longer hours than usual. He rarely missed his half-hour nap after lunch, rarely avoided the variety of ceremonial chores expected of him, and whatever the occasion, he appeared always to be enjoying himself, as though there was nothing else on his mind. In early May, time portrayed him meeting successive waves of crisis like a swimmer bobbing lightheartedly in the surf. In the week of his sixty-second birthday, apparently nothing could shake him. Only now and then were there momentary flashes of temper of a kind not seen before. Asked by one of the regular White House reporters at a press conference why they had been given no advance notice of a cabinet meeting, Truman snapped, I can hold a cabinet meeting whenever I choose. I don't have to tell you. In the notes he kept on his daily appointment sheets, he now had something caustic or derogatory to say about nearly everyone, including old Senate friends like Burton K. Wheeler, whom he now lumped with the spineless liberals. His own recent choice as the American representative on the United Nations Atomic Energy Commission, Bernard Baruch, was described as wanting to run the world, the moon, and maybe Jupiter. Inwardly, Truman was an extremely frustrated, resentful, and angry man, worn thin by criticism, fed up with crises not of his making and with people who, as he saw it, cared nothing for their country, only their own selfish interests. Big money has too much power, and so have the big unions. Both are riding to a fall because I like neither, he had written to his mother earlier, and his mood since had only worsened. A railroad strike coming on top of the coal strike would mean almost unimaginable catastrophe, paralysis everywhere. Negotiations between railway management and twenty different railway unions had dragged on for months, with Labor Secretary Schwellenbach serving not very effectively as Truman's mediator, while assisted by a new man on the White House staff, a big, gregarious, gum-chewing, former economics professor and labor specialist from Alabama named John R. Steelman. The unions had demanded higher wages. Truman, invoking the Railway Labor Act that provided for a 60-day mediation period, had ordered a delay in the strike. In April, the negotiations fell apart and the strike was set for May 18th. More talk followed, Steelman now replacing Schwellenbach as Truman's principal representative and apparently making progress. Of the twenty unions involved, all but two were ready to reach an accommodation. The problem was that the two holdouts were the two major unions. What so exasperated Truman was that they were also headed by two of his old allies, A. F. Whitney, president of the Brotherhood of Railroad Trainmen, and Alvin Lee Johnston, president of the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers, the same pair who in his hour of greatest need in the 1940 Senate race backed him when no one would, providing the lion's share of the money for his campaign. Moreover, at Chicago in 1944, they had been in the thick of the drive to make him Roosevelt's running mate. Whitney and Johnston were two white-haired veteran battlers, both now in their seventies. Whitney, who Truman knew best and liked, had by far the greatest power, since he represented more than 200,000 trainmen in 1,145 lodges nationwide. Johnston, who looked like a cartoonist's version of a labor boss, with a girth so broad he had difficulty buttoning his suit jacket, spoke for 80,000 locomotive engineers. Between them, they could shut down every railroad, all passenger service, all freight movement, from coast to coast, and there appeared to be nothing anyone could do about it. As the coal strike continued, John L. Lewis, large, theatrical, perpetually scowling under a broad-brimmed black fedora, was seen coming and going from the west wing of the White House, his entrances and exits made always, for the benefit of the newsreel cameras, at a slow, ambling walk, 
a man very conscious of the fact that he was the center of attention. On May 13th, Lewis agreed to a 12-day truce, but only days later the coal negotiations collapsed and Truman, reading from a prepared statement, told reporters the country was truly in desperate straits. When at a cabinet meeting Truman asked for constructive suggestions on how to handle the strike situation, nobody could offer any. On May 17th, with only a day remaining before the scheduled railroad walkout, Truman summoned Whitney and Johnston to his office. Whitney said they had to go through with the strike. Our men are demanding it. Well then, Truman replied, hunching forward in his chair, I'm going to give you the gun. As they watched, he signed an executive order for the government to seize and operate the railroads, effective the next day. Not quite 24 hours later, on Saturday the 18th, the two labor leaders agreed to postpone the strike for another five days. On Sunday, with apprehensions growing on all sides, Truman took off on a flying visit to Kansas City for the announced purpose of receiving an honorary degree from Little William Jewell College at nearby Liberty, Missouri. He also wanted to see his mother. With the help of friends, he and Vivian had finally managed to buy back from the county all of the old home place on Blue Ridge, the farm she so loved, even though, because of her deteriorating health, she would be unable to move back there. She and Mary Jane would continue on in the small yellow frame bungalow in Grandview, where they had been living since 1940. In conversation with friends in Missouri, Truman kept referring to Washington derisively as that place, and to the graduating class at William Jewell, he said leadership wasn't worth much without some followers. What the country needed was people who were willing to work, he said, speaking without notes. We have a society which is organized, and if one cog in the organization gives out, the whole structure begins to shake loose. Now let me urge upon you, get in line, get on the team, do a little work, help make the United States what it must be from now on, the leader of the world in peace as it was the leader of the world in war. I urge you to be good workers in the ranks. A White House reporter who made the trip, Felix Belair Jr. of the New York Times, asked Truman's physician, Colonel Graham, if perhaps the president was working too hard. Graham agreed, adding with emphasis that there was also nothing anyone could do about it. That's the way he is, said Graham. I try using a little applied psychology, but you know the president has a pretty good psychology of his own. He does the best he can by his job, and he knows there's no use worrying about it after that. The two old Truman friends from Independence, Mayor Roger Sermon and Harry Bunchu, a dry goods merchant and neighbor of the Trumans, warned Belair to watch out for the president's temper. He might be an easygoing fellow, but he was also no one to trifle with. When the feuding blood of his Kentucky ancestors was allowed to get the upper hand, Harry Truman was a man to be avoided, Belair wrote after talking with Sermon and Bunchu, who said they would prefer three or four ordinary men for enemies to one like Harry. To Belair, the president was becoming an increasingly fascinating subject, not at all the simple man he had supposed, but a complex personality, something others had known for a long time and would talk of again. In Independence, forty years later, one of Truman's nephews, J.C. Truman, Vivian's second son, would be asked by a visitor how he would describe his Uncle Harry, beyond what everyone knew. After a long pause, he answered, Complicated. On Tuesday, day three of the five-day postponement of the railway strike, Ed Flynn of the Bronx flew into Washington to see if he could help sway Whitney and Johnston, but without success. Nothing seemed to work. No compromise appeared likely. On Wednesday, Truman ordered seizure of the coal mines and proposed an eighteen-and-a-half-cent raise for the rail workers, again more than his own emergency fact-finding board had recommended. And still Whitney and Johnston viewed the proposal unfavorably. By Thursday, May 23rd, the day the strike was scheduled to begin at 5 p.m. Washington time, the situation at the White House had become extremely tense. The two union leaders were summoned one more time, along with officials representing management, and assigned to different rooms to resume bargaining, John Steelman moving back and forth between them. When Whitney and Johnston again refused Truman's offer, Steelman told them they simply couldn't say no to a president, insisting that that was just not done. Their response was that nobody paid attention to this president anyway. This was the fifth day of the postponement of the railroad strike, and it turned into one of the wildest days at the White House since the end of the war, wrote Eben Ayers in his diary. Newsmen thronged the lobby, tense and excited. The president was in his office as usual, and met from time to time with Steelman, John Snyder, and Schwellenbach. This situation went on all day long. 
Early in the afternoon, the president ordered John Pye, the colored messenger who runs the executive lunchroom, to prepare some sandwiches, and they were sent in to the railroad people. I did not go out for lunch, nor did my secretaries. During the course of the day, Secretary of State Burns came over, secretly, so newspapermen did not know of his visit, and he argued with Whitney and Johnston for some time, trying to point out to them the effect upon our international relations of a general rail strike at this time. At about four in the afternoon, with only an hour to go before the strike would begin, Truman went out to the South Lawn to host a reception for nearly 900 convalescent veterans from Walter Reed and other nearby military hospitals, among whom were amputees and others so severely disabled that they moved forward in the receiving line on crutches and in wheelchairs, attended by nurses in starched white uniforms. Such garden parties for hospitalized veterans had been an annual May tradition at the White House since 1919, but were discontinued during the war. Truman, some weeks earlier, had asked that the tradition be revived. The spring afternoon was ideal, with bright sunshine, blue sky, and flowers in bloom. Several of the cabinet were present with their wives, as were Admiral Nimitz and General Bradley. The Marine Band played. Strawberry ice cream and lemon punch were served, and for more than an hour Truman stood warmly greeting his guests, who were all in uniform and wearing their campaign ribbons. Always moved by the sight of wounded veterans, Truman was struck especially now by the contrast between these respectful young men who had made such sacrifices for their country, and who were so plainly pleased to meet him, and the two contentious old Union bosses inside. He kept smiling, chatting, patting the men on the back, asking where they were from, making every effort to see that they had a good time. Only once was he seen glancing over his shoulder in the direction of the cabinet room, where the long French windows, under the colonnade, stood open to the air. Rumors were passed of progress in the negotiations. A soldier in a wheelchair said, Draft all the strikers, all of them. Another claimed he wouldn't be president for anything. Truman drank a glass of punch. When a Strauss waltz was played, he walked over beside the band to sit and eat a heaping dish of ice cream, tapping his foot in time to the music. By then it was well past five and the strike was on. There had never been a total railroad stoppage until now. Almost at once the whole country was brought virtually to a standstill. Of 24,000 freight trains normally in operation, fewer than 300 ran. Of 175,000 passenger trains, all of 100 moved. Rush hour commuters were stranded in New York and Chicago. In the West, coast-to-coast -coast streamliners stopped and disgorged passengers at tiny way stations in the middle of the desert. There were poignant scenes, reported Newsweek. The Chicago woman kept from her father's deathbed in Minnesota. The 13-year-old Arizona boy en route for an emergency brain operation in California. The woman taking the body of her husband back to Cleveland for burial. Other, less painful dilemmas. The Philadelphia Symphony Orchestra's San Francisco-bound special train was abandoned by crewmen. Ball clubs found their mid-season travels stymied. The circus, scheduled to leave for Philadelphia, was forced to give Boston an extra dose of the biggest show on earth. Everywhere, the stranded who refused to sleep on emergency cots set up in hotel basements or armories took to bus, airplanes, taxis, and hitchhiking. Washington cabbies had a field day. Their price for a ride to Boston was $150, to Atlanta, $100. Newsreel camera crews rushed to film hundreds of freight cars standing motionless in rail yards as far as the eye could see, loaded coal cars standing idle, and baggage piled head-high in big city stations. There were reports of fortunes in lettuce and fruit rotting in Kansas and California. Officials in Washington announced that in Europe hundreds of thousands of people would starve if grain shipments were held up as much as two weeks. Panic buying for food and gasoline broke out everywhere in the country. No one, no community was untouched. Telegrams flooding the White House came from every quarter and minced no words. All train service out of New York cancelled. What now? Hatcheries, in Henry County, Missouri, now producing millions of chicks weekly which are a total loss unless shipped immediately by rail when hatched. This agricultural area, Corning, California, will be ruined if the strike continues. Mr. President, zero hour is here. Who is to rule our nation? The legally constituted authorities or isolated domestic groups? Please forget selfish politics long enough to remember that other people besides labor leaders have to live and eat. They also vote. Is the present incumbent impotent in the railroad strike? If so, he should resign.
Why don't you go ahead and act in this national crisis? You are our leader. Prompt action is the only thing that can save our country. Less talk and more action. Quit playing politics. Time to get tough. Respectfully urge you to rise to the occasion. Truman had had all he could take. Alone at his desk upstairs at the White House on a small, cheap, ruled tablet of the kind school children use, he began to write. It was the draft of a speech, a speech he had no intention of giving, but that he needed desperately to get off his chest. It was another of his long-hand spasms, and the worst. He filled seven pages. All the pent-up fury of the past weeks, the feelings evoked by the wounded men on the South Lawn, his sense of betrayal at the hands of old friends Whitney and Johnston, and the sense that they were flouting the highest office, not to say belittling him personally, all his stubborn pride came spewing forth in one of the most intemperate documents ever written by an American president. It was as though somewhere deep within this normally fair-minded, self-controlled, naturally warm-hearted man, a raw, ugly old native strain persisted, like the cry of a frontier lynch mob, and had to be released. Probably he wrote in a state of exhaustion late that night. Possibly whiskey played a part, but no one knows. The speech could also have been written in the cold light of the next morning, which, if so, makes it still more appalling. Under his constitutional powers as president, he would call for volunteers to support the Constitution, he said at the start. Then, after a few pages of praise for the Constitution and for the decisive role America had played in winning the war, he continued with what was on his mind. At home, those of us who had the country's welfare at heart worked day and night, but some people worked neither day nor night, and some tried to sabotage the war effort entirely. No one knows that better than I. John Lewis called two strikes in wartime to satisfy his ego. Two strikes which were worse than bullets in the back to our soldiers. He held a gun at the head of the government. The rail unions did exactly the same thing. They all were receiving from four to forty times what the man who was facing the enemy fire on the front was receiving. The effete union leaders received from five to ten times the net salary of your president. Now these same union leaders on VJ Day told your president that they would cooperate one hundred percent with him to reconvert to peacetime production. They all lied to him. First came the threatened automobile strike. Your president asked for legislation to cool off and consider the situation. A weak-kneed Congress didn't have the intestinal fortitude to pass the bill. Mr. Murray and his communist friends had a conniption fit and Congress had labor jitters. Nothing happened. Then came the electrical workers' strike, the steel strike, the coal strike, and now the rail tie-up. Every single one of the strikers and their demagogue leaders have been living in luxury, working when they pleased. I am tired of the governance being flouted, vilified, and misrepresented. Now I want you men who are my comrades in arms, you men who fought the battles to save the nation just as I did twenty-five years ago, to come along with me and eliminate the Lewises, the Whitneys, the Johnstons, the Communist Bridges, head of the Maritime Union, and the Russian senators and representatives, and really make this a government of, by, and for the people. I think no more of the Wall Street crowd than I do of Lewis and Whitney. Let us give the country back to the people. Let's put transportation and production back to work, hang a few traitors, make our own country safe for democracy, tell the Russians where to get off and make the United Nations work. Come on, boys, let's do the job. It was patriotism run amuck, as well as absurdly inaccurate. Real workers earned nothing like forty times the pay of a soldier. The salaries of the union leaders were less, not more, than Truman's own of seventy-five thousand dollars a year. And to describe Whitney or Johnston or John L. Lewis as a feat was laughable. He was even off in his math, calculating the time elapsed since his war of 1918. What was very accurately reflected, however, was the intensity of his rage and his determination now to set things straight. The look on Truman's face as he strode into a special meeting of the cabinet Friday morning, May 24th, was one White House reporters would not forget. The gray-blue eyes blazed behind his glasses. His mouth was a thin, hard line pulled down at the corners, his back straight as a rod of steel. In the manner of Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation, remembered Cabell Phillips of the New York Times, he had summoned them not to solicit their views, but to tell them what he was going to do. It was a Harry Truman they had not seen before, but that some on his staff knew well and liked. He's one tough son of a bitch of a man, Harry Vaughn would say. That was the key to understanding Harry Truman.
With the cabinet assembled around the table, he asked for suggestions on operation of the railroads. No one had any. He would go before Congress the following day, he told them, but first address the country by radio that night. He had decided to draft the striking rail workers into the army. There was a moment of stunned silence. The Attorney General, Tom Clark, questioned whether the President was overstepping the bounds of the Constitution. Truman was not interested in philosophy. The strike must stop. We'll draft them and think about the law later, he reportedly remarked. His seven-page speech draft was handed over to Charlie Ross, who, having read it, told Truman as an old friend that it wouldn't do. Sam Rosenman was sent for, and a new speech written, with Rosenman, Ross, John Snyder, and Truman himself all contributing. But the main work, and at Truman's request, was done by a rising new star at the White House, Navy Captain Clark Clifford, who had been posted temporarily the summer before as assistant to Jake Vardaman, and then, when Vardaman was removed, had stepped in as naval aide. Clifford was thirty-nine years old, over six feet tall, broad in the shoulders, slim-waisted, and handsome as a screen actor, with wavy blonde hair and a silky baritone voice. In his Navy uniform he looked almost too glamorous to be true or to be taken seriously, but he was calm, clear-headed, polished as a career diplomat, and, as Truman had quickly perceived, exceedingly capable. Indeed, Clifford's almost chance presence on the staff would prove to be one of the luckiest breaks of Truman's presidency. I'd never been in the White House, Clifford would remember. Never occurred to me I ever would be in the White House. Oh, it was exciting. And at first, as naval aide, there wasn't much to do. You're kind of a potted plant. The first time I arrived there, the first day, Vardaman took me in. He said, President Truman, this is Lieutenant Junior Grade Clifford, who is going to look after my office. And Truman looked up and said, Big fellow, isn't he? Clifford had been raised in the fashionable west end of St. Louis. His father was an official with the Missouri Pacific Railroad, his mother a lecturer and author of children's books. An uncle, for whom he was named, Clark McAdams, had been a brilliant editorial page editor for the Post-Dispatch. Educated at Washington University, where he also took a law degree, Clifford himself had been a highly successful trial attorney in St. Louis before the war, while still in his early thirties. I think he did feel an affinity with those who had come from that part of the country and been schooled in that part of the country, and spoke very much as he did, Clifford would say of the President years later. It was an important factor. I'm not sure he would have admitted to its being, but it happened to be so. But in no respect did Clifford resemble the other Missourians around Truman. He was of a different generation, an entirely different style, as even the sharpest critics of the administration would acknowledge. Alone of all the Truman entourage, Clifford has the brains, the personal élan, and the savoir-faire requisite of a big leaguer, Washington correspondents Robert S. Allen and William V. Shannon would soon write in a highly critical book called The Truman Merry-Go-Round. Clifford, they judged, was really of White House class. Clifford, who had had little knowledge of Truman or any particular interest in him prior to coming to the White House, soon found himself greatly impressed, devoted to the man in a way he would never have expected. The President is intelligent, forthright, and reasonable, Clifford had written to his mother. I have developed a deep and abiding affection for him, and hope and trust that I may be able to be of some small assistance to him. Late the afternoon of the 24th, with no time to spare, Clifford went to work on his first major assignment. Alone at the long, polished table in the cabinet room, he labored as he would often again, grubbing it out with a yellow legal pad and a soft pencil. For all his many abilities, Clifford was not a facile or inspired writer, nothing like Sam Rosenman. He was not even a good writer, as he conceded, but he worked intensely, writing, erasing, and rewriting one sentence after another, laboriously down the page. He began at five o'clock. By eight a rough draft was ready, and by then a dozen people were in the President's office, waiting to take part. The revisions went on to the very last minute. Rose Conway, the President's secretary, was still typing the final pages of his reading copy as he went on the air. Truman's own efforts on the ruled tablet paper, meantime, were tucked away in Clifford's file, to remain undisclosed for another twenty years. Truman spoke to the country at ten o'clock Eastern Time. Margaret, who had been in New York to see a play with her friend Drusy Snyder, John Snyder's daughter, and who, because of the strike, had had to borrow a car and drive back to Washington, fighting heavy traffic the whole way, arrived at the White House as her father's broadcast was about to begin. She would remember him looking as tired as she felt. "'I come before the American people tonight at a time of great crisis,' he said. "'The crisis of Pearl Harbor was the result of action by a foreign enemy.' 
The crisis tonight is caused by a group of men within our own country who place their private interests above the welfare of the nation. His voice was firm, deadly serious. It was time for plain speaking. This was no contest between labor and management, but between two willful men and their government. I am a friend of labor, but it is inconceivable that in our democracy any two men should be placed in a position where they can completely stifle our economy and ultimately destroy our country. He called on the striking railroad workers to return to their jobs as a duty to their country and warned that if a sufficient number did not return by 4 p.m. the next day, he would call out the army and do whatever else was necessary to break the strike. He did not say anything about drafting the strikers. That he was saving for his speech to Congress the next afternoon. Sam Rosenman, who was up most of the night working on the Congress speech, was opposed to the whole idea of drafting the rail workers. Attorney General Clark had also by now put his concerns in writing. The Draft Act does not permit the induction of occupational groups, and it is doubtful whether constitutional powers of the President would include the right to draft individuals for national purposes. Jimmy Burns, too, was strongly opposed, but Truman would not be budged. The conference on the speech to Congress took place Saturday morning in Truman's office. John Steelman, meanwhile, had hurried off to see Whitney and Johnston at their suite at the Statler Hotel, determined to make one last try. Truman's appearance before Congress was scheduled for four o'clock. The speech was nearly ready at three when Steelman called from the hotel to say he was making progress. The strike might be settled within the hour. Rosenman and Clifford went into the cabinet room and wrote three or four alternative pages. At 3.35, Steelman called again to report the situation still unresolved. By now it was past time for Truman to leave for the Capitol. Clifford, the new pages in hand, had to run to catch the President's car. It was another sparkling day and as warm as summer. In the crowded house chamber, even with the air conditioning on, many of the members sat mopping their brows. In the gallery, Bess and Margaret could be seen quietly waiting. When, at a few minutes past four, Truman walked in, a grim look on his face, the whole room resounded with the biggest ovation he had yet received as president, while in Sam Rayburn's office close by, Clifford was frantically on the phone again with Steelman, who now said a settlement was awful close. Steelman had an agreement on paper in longhand, but it still had to be typed and signed. He said they had verbally agreed to the points which they had in writing, Clifford remembered, but there was no knowing whether they would finally sign. He would stay by the phone, Clifford told Steelman. For the past two days, the nation has been in the grip of a railroad strike which threatens to paralyze all our industrial, agricultural, commercial, and social life. The disaster will spare no one, Truman said from the rostrum. Strikes against the government must stop. The Congress and the President of the United States must work together, and we must work fast. In the packed press gallery behind him, reporters were writing furiously. Spotlights blaze, cameras were, his Missouri voice covers America, wrote Richard Strout of the New Republic. He was calling, Truman said, for temporary emergency legislation to authorize the president to draft into the armed forces of the United States all workers who are on strike against their government. The audience roared its approval. At that moment, Les Biffle, secretary of the Senate, hurried into the chamber and handed Truman a slip of red paper, a note from Clifford. Truman glanced at it, then looked up. Word has just been received, he said, that the railroad strike has been settled on terms proposed by the President. The whole Congress rose to cheer and applaud everyone on both sides of the aisle. The sudden interruption by Biffle, the red note in Truman's hand, the surprise of his announcement had all been like something in a movie. Some in the audience suspected the entire scene had been concocted for effect, which it had not. Yet Truman himself made no attempt at dramatics. His grim expression never changed, and having come that far in the speech, he continued on, delivering the rest of it as he would have anyway. The President, who of late had seemed so often bewildered and inadequate, had proved himself extremely tough and decisive when the chips were down, and the reaction of the Congress and of the country by and large was instantaneous approval. His bold action was praised in the press and by leaders in both parties. He had grown in national stature, said the Atlanta Constitution. He had met magnificently one of the greatest tests of courage ever to face an American president, declared the Philadelphia record. Harry Truman, wrote Felix Belair in the New York Times, had shown he could be tough, plenty tough, when the occasion demanded, 
He was no less the average guy on the streetcar, or driving with the family on Sunday, such as he had always been pictured. But just now he was also a man who could rise to the occasion. The House of Representatives gave him all he wanted, passing the bill to draft the strikers by a margin of 306 to 13, after a debate of less than two hours that same evening. The Senate, however, refused to be stampeded, largely at the insistence of Senator Taft, who was outraged by the bill, certain that it violated every principle of American jurisprudence. And there were concerns among liberals on the Democratic side as well. Claude Pepper said he would rather give up his seat in the Senate than support such a measure. A. F. Whitney declared that Truman had signed his own political death warrant. You can't make a president out of a ribbon clerk, Whitney exclaimed at a cheering labor rally in New York's Madison Square Park. Placards in the crowd said, Down with Truman, Break with Truman. He was denounced as the country's number one strikebreaker, called a fascist, a traitor to the Union movement. Later, vowing revenge, Whitney claimed he would spend the last dollar in the treasury of the Brotherhood of Railroad Trainmen to defeat Harry Truman should he dare run for re-election in 1948. Prominent liberals were thunderstruck. Sidney Hillman, who was on his deathbed, spoke out against Truman as he never had. Draft men who strike in peacetime into the armed services? wrote Richard Strout in The New Republic. Is this Russia or Germany? To Truman, Mrs. Roosevelt wrote politely that there must not be any slip, because of the difficulties of our peacetime situation, into a military way of thinking. Ultimately, the proposal to draft the strikers was defeated in the Senate, 70 to 13, the initial cries of Taft and Pepper having grown to a chorus. But the strike was over, the trains were running again. To the great majority of Americans, Truman had exhibited exactly the kind of backbone they expected of a president. To most, it seemed he had been left no other choice. He had done only what he had to do, and shown at last that somebody was in charge. I was the servant of 150 million people of the United States, Truman himself would later say, and I had to do the job even if I lost my political career. He had no regrets. Days later, the coal strike too ended. On May 29th, John L. Lewis met with the coal operators at the White House to sign a new contract. Lewis, it appeared, would be a problem no more, having achieved all he wished for his miners. An eighteen and a half cent per hour raise, one hundred dollars in vacation pay, a guaranteed five-day work week, and the five cent royalty on every ton of coal mined to go into a welfare fund. While other labor leaders continued the uproar over Truman, the habitually oratund Lewis at last, amazingly, kept silent. For Truman himself, the crisis had provided a chance finally to stand his ground, even take the offensive, none of which did his spirits any harm. Also, importantly, the crisis marked the emergence of Clark Clifford. In another few weeks, Clifford took Sam Rosenman's former position as legal counsel to the president and would remain at Truman's side almost constantly. 4. The lift that came from settlement of the rail and coal strikes was short-lived for Truman, and whatever confidence he had gained with the American people by his actions, he seemed incapable of holding on to it. As June came and went, as the summer wore on, criticism in the press, dissatisfaction on the hill, continued. Little went right, and with Bess and Margaret back in independence through the hot months, Truman found himself beset again by loneliness. In August, when Congress left town for its first real break since before the war, and he attempted a vacation of his own, it got off in the wrong direction at first and ended in a storm. Then in September he stepped into a silly tangle with Henry Wallace that made him look more of a bumbler than ever in his career. As George Elsie was to remark years later, nothing about the Wallace affair was well done. It was miserably handled from one end to the other. On June 6th, without warning, Truman announced two major appointments, expecting wide approval. To replace Chief Justice Harlan Stone, who had died in April, he had picked Fred Vinson, the Secretary of the Treasury. To fill Vinson's place, he chose John Snyder. He thought they were exceptionally able men and trusted both implicitly. Yet to many they were singularly uninspiring choices and seemed to have been made in haste, an impression Truman had only himself to blame for. Asked the day of the announcement when he had made up his mind on Vinson, he snapped, about an hour and a half ago. As Secretary of the Treasury, Vinson had seemed very suitably cast, solid, knowledgeable, with a broad understanding of government machinery. Truman, who had not known Vinson well in the Senate, had since come to admire him greatly, considered him a devoted and undemonstrative patriot, 
with, as Truman would write, a sense of personal and political loyalty seldom found among the top men in Washington. But Vincent was known more for political sagacity than judicial brilliance, and the choice of the colorless Snyder as his replacement seemed only to underscore the charge of government by crony. Portrayed in the press as a doer little St. Louis banker, Snyder seemed hardly adequate for the second highest ranking position in the cabinet. The liberals and former New Dealers especially, Snyder was a pathetic choice. Unadmiring reporters described him as a repressed man with a pinched, unhappy look, who occasionally tries to loosen up with a hefty intake of bourbon or by telling a dirty story. Among fiscal conservatives, the best that could be said for Snyder was that he might prove cautious. In fact, he was quite cautious, quite conservative, a plugger who worked long hours, often seven days a week. His appearance to the contrary, he was also a man of much personal warmth, and though lacking in imagination, he had, like Vincent, a great deal of common sense, a quality Truman had often found wanting in more brilliant or charming men. In Tennyson's Locksley Hall, the poem still neatly folded in his wallet, was the line affirming that it was the common sense of most, the common sense of ordinary humanity, which would ultimately hold a fretful realm in awe. In Paris in July, at another drawn-out acrimonious session of the Council of Foreign Ministers, Secretary of State Burns was making little progress with Molotov in the peace treaty negotiations. In April, his relations with the President still strained, Burns had told Truman privately that he wished to resign, pleading health problems, but Truman had asked him to stay on at least until the end of the year. Confidentially, through General Eisenhower, Truman informed George Marshall in China that he wanted him to become the next Secretary of State once Burns departed. Senator Vandenberg, who was part of the American delegation in Paris, came home to report appalling disagreement over Germany and intense suspicions between Russia and the West. There were worries over Russia, worries over Europe, worries over China. In France and Italy, the communists were emerging as the strongest single political units. In China, the Red Armies of Mao Zedong were making steady gains against the nationalist government forces of Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek. To a group of editors and executives from the McGraw-Hill Publishing Company who met with him informally in his office, Truman conceded that the difficulties with China were very, very bad. He was even having troubles back home in Jackson County. Infuriated by a congressman from his own district, Democrat Roger C. Slaughter, who as a member of the House Rules Committee had been stalling progress on the Fair Employment Practices Bill, Truman decided not to support him for re-election and made a show of bringing Jim Pendergast to the White House to talk about it. If Mr. Slaughter is right, I'm wrong, Truman told reporters. He had Pendergast back another candidate in the primary, Enos Axtell, with the result that some in the old Kansas City organization began resorting to their former ways, causing a storm of outrage in the Kansas City Star. When Truman returned to Independence the first week in August to vote in the primary, he discovered that the Star had a reporter staked out with binoculars, keeping watch on 219 North Delaware to record his every move. Seeing the reporter early the next day, Truman made a point of telling him in detail exactly how he had spent the morning thus far, including certain acts performed in the bathroom. Axtell's victory in the primary was hailed by Bob Hannigan as a vote of confidence for the president. Reporters in Kansas City, however, turned up evidence of vote fraud, and though three federal judges found only minor violations in the election, Truman's involvement looked none too good reviving old stories of his own past connection to the Pendergast machine, not to say doubts about his sense of propriety. Clark Clifford remembered it as a summer of wallowing. Even the president's health declined. He suffered from an ear infection and a return of stomach pains, such as he had not had in years, the result, said Wallace Graham, of a nervous condition. Obviously he needs a rest from the strain he's under, noted Charlie Ross in his diary, though he looks the picture of health. Had the most awful day I've ever had Tuesday, Truman wrote to his mother and sister on July 31st. Saw somebody every fifteen minutes on a different subject, held a cabinet luncheon and spent two solid hours discussing Palestine and got nowhere. Today's been almost as bad, but not quite. Got in a swim for the first time since February. He was distressed about his mother's failing health. She's on the way out, he wrote to Bess. It can't be helped. She's a trial to marry, and that can't be helped either. He wished Bess would be more patient with them. Bess and Margaret remained in independence, Bess looking after her own mother, Margaret working with a voice teacher from Kansas City. Be good and be tough, she advised her father at the close of one chatty, affectionate letter. I still have a number of bills staring me in the face, Truman wrote to Bess on August 10th. 
Burns called me from Paris this morning asking me not to veto a State Department reorganization bill, which I told Clark Clifford I was sure as a striped pants boy's bill to sidetrack the Secretary of State. Jimmy told me it wasn't, but I'm still not sure. I have another one under consideration which restores civil and military rights to a captain in the quartermaster department. He was court-martialed in 1926 in Panama for some seven or eight charges under the 93rd and 96th Articles of War. Dick Duncan, a federal district judge in Missouri and former congressman, is interested because the fellow's from St. Joe and he put the bill through the House and I put it through the Senate on two occasions, and Roosevelt vetoed it both times. When I read the record, I'm not so sure Roosevelt wasn't right. Ain't it awful what a difference it makes where you sit? I gave the whole thing to Clifford and told him to give me a cold-blooded report on it. I have another one which is a pain in the neck. Hayden, Senator Carl Hayden, my good friend and Congressman Cecil Rhodes King want it signed. Clinton Anderson wants it disapproved, and it looks like Anderson is right. It sure is hell to be president. Longing for a vacation, eager to get away from both Washington and Independence, he had thought first of going to Alaska, he had always wanted to see Alaska, but decided instead on a cruise on the Williamsburg to New England in August and invited his old friend and best man, Ted Marks, to join an all-male party that included Snyder, Ross, Clifford, Vaughn, George Allen, Matt Connolly, and Colonel Graham, enough for an eight-handed game of poker. Truman loved the Williamsburg. It's just wonderful, he often told its commander, Donald J. MacDonald. In ten minutes I'm away from everything. He loved cruising on the river in placid waters, the green Virginia shoreline slipping by, other boats passing. When he wasn't napping or playing cards, MacDonald remembered years later, President Truman was often up on the bridge with us or sitting on deck. Boats would come alongside and people waved to him, which he seemed to enjoy. The boaters were just thrilled to see him. It was a different time, and no one thought of taking a pot shot at him. In fact, I think the Secret Service thoroughly enjoyed whenever he went on the Williamsburg, because he became my responsibility. They just went along for the ride. I think often of this. The first few days, Truman gave up shaving and dipped into Arthur Schlesinger Jr.'s The Age of Jackson. But the poker and the comradeship were, as so often, what he obviously liked best and needed most. Getting together with his old friends with whom he was completely comfortable was the greatest relaxation he had, remembered Clifford. See, he had no airs. He never put on airs of any kind. He was much more relaxed with them. He didn't have to be careful with them. And if he wanted to have a couple of drinks, why, he felt perfectly at ease. Nobody ever did it to excess, but that was part of the relaxation. And some of the jokes would be of the type that would not have been told in the White House, and they'd be awfully funny. And perhaps Missouri rural jokes of one kind, and then he had a wonderfully expansive, expressive laugh. They were important, such times on the Williamsburg more important than most people might know, because he felt the strains very, very much. He liked to pretend a little that he didn't. He'd say, oh, I sleep fine at night. Asked once by a reporter what his attitude was toward card games, Truman replied with a twinkle in his eye, card games? The only game I know anything about is that game. Let me see, I don't know what the name is, but you put one card down on the table and four face up and you bet. His enjoyment of poker came mainly from the companionship it provided. He was considered a fairly good player, but by no means exceptional. He was what was called a loose player, rarely staying out of a pot, and often betting freely with an occasional bluff. He was full of mischief at the table. Dealing left-handed, he loved to taunt anyone needing a particular card. Sometimes, after taking a poll of what the others wanted to play, he would deal something else. He liked games with wild cards, and especially a version of ordinary stud poker that he called Papa Vinson, after Fred Vinson, who was a particularly skillful player. He always plays a close hand, I'll say that, Ted Marks remembered. You can tell when he's winning because there's a kind of smile on his face. As Truman himself conceded, poker was by far his favorite relaxation, my favorite form of paperwork. It took his mind off other things more than anything else. It made no difference to him if the stakes were nickels and dimes, and no apparent difference to his enjoyment of the game if he won or lost. Wallace Graham thought the president played poker as much for what it revealed about the other players at the table as for the pleasure of the game itself. The fact that Vincent, for example, was an expert player was not incidental to Truman's high regard for Vincent. Clifford, who had played little until coming to the White House, but had bought a book on the game and studied assiduously, would remember that on this and other trips on the yacht, poker, except for meals, took up the better part of most days,
but that lunch often lasted two hours or more because of all the talk, Truman obviously enjoying every moment and contributing more than his share. I will bet that the subject of his selection as Roosevelt's running mate in Chicago must have come up forty times, all the different facets about it. The President's drinking, widespread stories notwithstanding, was moderate. Some mornings on deck he might squint at the sky and comment that it must be noon somewhere in the world and ask for a bourbon. On occasion he would show the effects of several drinks, expressing himself, as Clifford later wrote, in language less restrained and more colorful than he would otherwise use, and especially if he had had a particularly vexing week. But he could also nurse a single drink through a whole evening of talk and poker. The Williamsburg, being a commissioned vessel, was not supposed to serve liquor, recalled MacDonald, but as commander-in-chief it was, of course, Truman's prerogative to drink on board if he so wished. I made no issue of that. Old Grandad was his favorite. When at Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island they hit cold winds, rain, and fog, Truman ordered a change in plans. They turned and headed south to Bermuda, which he knew had been Woodrow Wilson's favorite retreat, and where finally, in ideal weather, he enjoyed a few days of peace and uninterrupted sunshine. This is a paradise you dream about but hardly ever see, he wrote to Margaret on August 23rd. But in Hampton Roads on the return to Washington they sailed straight into a storm. The 244-foot Williamsburg, built in 1930 as a private yacht and purchased by the Navy at the outset of the war, had never been a particularly good sea-going vessel, even after several hundred tons of pig iron were put down in the bilges to improve stability. Now the ship did all sorts of antics, as Truman would tell his mother. Violently ill, he took to his bed. The furniture was taking headers in every direction, he told Bess, and it was necessary to stay in bed to keep your legs on. His stateroom was a shambles. Papers, books, chairs, clothing, yours, Margaret's and Mama's pictures, mixed up with Time, Newsweek, Reader's Digest, Collier's, Saturday Evening Post, luggage, pillows. Looked as if it never would be in shape again. The summer heat of Washington held, and again he was alone in the great white jail, as he had begun calling the White House. Some of the servants had been telling him how the ghost of Abraham Lincoln had appeared over the years. Truman became convinced the house was haunted. Night before last, he reported to Bess, I went to bed at nine o'clock after shutting my doors. At four o'clock I was awakened by three distinct knocks on my bedroom door. I jumped up and put on my bathrobe, opened the door, and no one there. Went out and looked up and down the hall, looked into your room and Margie's. Still no one. Went back to bed after locking the doors, and there were footsteps in your room whose door I'd left open. Jumped up and looked and no one there. Damn place is haunted sure as shootin'. Secret Service said not even a watchman was up here at that hour. More and more he disliked living there. Better it be made a museum, he thought, and give the president a rent allowance. That way, he told Bess, they could move back to the apartment on Connecticut Avenue, an idea he knew she would welcome. You better lock your door and prop up some chairs, and next time you hear knocks, don't answer, Margaret advised him. It'll probably be A. Jackson in person. The little oak-paneled elevator that had carried him to the second floor the afternoon of Franklin Roosevelt's death was being replaced with new equipment. The old elevator, dating from Theodore Roosevelt's day, had moved too slowly for Truman, and on one occasion broke down, leaving him stranded between floors. He had to ring a gong and wait for the workman to hurry to the basement and jiggle the apparatus back into motion. New chandeliers were being installed, his bathtub fitted with a glass shower stall, but he had little faith in the old house. The stock market was falling. A maritime strike that had begun on the West Coast was rapidly spreading. Next thing he thought, the White House roof would cave in. I'm in the middle no matter what happens, he wrote mournfully the second week of September, on the eve of the Wallace fiasco. At a press conference in his office the afternoon of Thursday, September 12th, the President was asked by a reporter to comment on a speech scheduled to be given by the Secretary of Commerce at a political rally in New York at Madison Square Garden that evening, copies of which had already been distributed to the press. Truman said he couldn't answer questions about a speech that had not yet been delivered, at which Charlie Ross and others of the staff standing by appeared to breathe a sigh of relief. If the President had only stopped there, Ross later wrote, the reporter, William Mylander of the Cowles newspapers, pressed on, saying Secretary Wallace referred in the speech to the President himself, which was why he had asked. There was laughter, and Truman good-naturedly said that, being the case, perhaps he should hear the question. 
Mylander, who held a copy of the speech in his hand, said it contained a sentence asserting that the president had read these words and that they represented administration policy. That was correct, said Truman. Was he endorsing a particular paragraph or the whole speech? He had approved the whole speech, Truman said breezily. Reporters looked at one another. Mr. President, asked Raymond Brandt of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, do you regard Wallace's speech a departure from Burns's policy? I do not, Truman snapped back, before Brandt could finish his sentence. Toward Russia? They are exactly in line, said Truman, in a manner implying the question was frivolous and that he wished reporters would ask something harder. In truth, he hadn't read all the speech, or hadn't been paying attention when Wallace went over it with him, and had given it no thought since. The president, noted Charlie Ross in his diary, had now been betrayed by his own amiability. According to Wallace's diary account, he and Truman had run through the speech together page by page, and Truman agreed with everything in it. He didn't have a single change to suggest, Wallace wrote. Clark Clifford, too, would remember Wallace reading through the speech for the president, but Truman, in his own diary, said he had been able to give Wallace only ten or fifteen minutes, most of which had been taken up with other matters. He had tried to skim through it, Truman wrote, assuming that Wallace was cooperating in all phases of administration policy, including foreign policy. One paragraph caught my eye. It said that we held no special friendship for Russia, Britain, or any other country, that we wanted to see all the world at peace on an equal basis. I said that is, of course, what we want. It was on the basis of this single paragraph only, according to Truman, that he gave his approval, trusting to Henry to play square with me. In private conversation with Charlie Ross, he also admitted that he had looked at only parts of the speech, relying on Wallace's assurance that the rest was all right. And most of the speech was indeed in line with administration policy. Wallace urged support for the United Nations, called for increased international trade and international control of atomic weapons. But he also condemned British imperialism and appeared to be advocating American and Russian spheres of interest in the world, a concept strongly opposed by Burns. The United States, Wallace said, had no more business in the political affairs of Eastern Europe than Russia has in the political affairs of Latin America. Any get-tough policy was foolhardy. Get-tough never brought anything real and lasting, whether for schoolyard bullies or businessmen or world power, Wallace said. The tougher we get, the tougher the Russians will get. At Madison Square Garden, departing from his prepared text, Wallace told an audience of 20,000, an audience in part vociferously pro-Soviet, I realize that the danger of war is much less from communism than it is from imperialism. As James Reston wrote in the New York Times the following day, Truman appeared to be the only person in Washington who saw no difference between what Wallace had said and his own policy, or that of his Secretary of State in Paris, who reportedly was outraged. An angry Arthur Vandenberg declared there could be only one Secretary of State at a time. Saturday morning, the 14th, his immediate staff gathered about his desk, Truman openly berated himself for having made so grave a blunder. At a press conference that afternoon, he read a carefully prepared statement, and this time no questions were permitted. There had been a natural misunderstanding, Truman said. His answer to Mr. Mylander's question had not conveyed the thought intended. It had been his wish only to express approval of Secretary Wallace's right to deliver the speech, Truman insisted, not approval of the speech itself. Having stumbled into trouble, he was clumsily and obviously fabricating in a desperate effort to get himself out and get Burns off the hook in Paris. There has been no change in the established foreign policy of our country, he also said, which was true but did no good. The criticism continued to mount, wrote Ross, who had helped prepare the statement. Dispatches from Paris indicated that Burns and his delegation felt that something more needed to be done, and indeed they were right. The question still remained whether Wallace was to be allowed to go on attacking in public the foreign policy line laid down by Burns at Paris. The press secretary's seat became warmer and warmer. I could only reply to questions that the president and Burns were not in communication. The Wallace episode boiled on for days. As Wallace continued to tell reporters that he stood by his speech, Truman kept to a light schedule, saying nothing further for attribution. Then Ross, too, blundered badly. Hearing that columnist Drew Pearson had obtained a long private letter written by Wallace to Truman two months earlier, a letter apparently leaked to Pearson by someone in the State Department, Ross, without approval from Truman, agreed with Wallace that the letter should be released to the press in order to deny Pearson the limelight. When Ross informed the President of what he had done, Truman told him to call Wallace at once and stop release of the letter, but by then it was too late. The letter was out. Dated July 23rd, it consisted of twelve single-space type pages more critical even of administration policy than Wallace's speech had been. Forcefully advocating a new approach to the Soviet Union, Wallace charged, among other things, that certain unnamed members of the U.S. military command advocated a preventive war before Russia had time to develop an atomic bomb.
I'm still having Henry Wallace trouble, and it grows worse as we go along, Truman confided plaintively to his mother on Wednesday, September 18th. Wallace was expected momentarily at the White House. I think he'll quit today, and I won't shed any tears. Never was there such a mess, and it is partly my making. But when I make a mistake, it is a good one. To Wallace, too, Truman said he had only himself to blame for most of what had happened. He had not known so many sleepless nights since the convention at Chicago. They talked alone in the Oval Office, Wallace giving no sign that he intended to quit. His mail, Wallace said, was running five to one in favor of his New York speech. The people are afraid that the get-tough-with-Russia policy is leading us to war, Wallace told him. You yourself, as Harry Truman, really believed in my speech. He advised Truman to be far to the left when Congress was not in session, then move to the right when Congress returned. That was the Roosevelt technique, Wallace said. Roosevelt had never let his right hand know what his left hand was up to. Henry told me during our conversation that as president I couldn't play square, Truman would report to Bess, that anything was justified so long as we stayed in power. If Truman would only lean more in his direction, Wallace said, it would mean victory for the Democrats in Congress in November. Truman told him he thought the Congress would go Republican in any event. He asked Wallace to stop making foreign policy speeches or to agree to the policy for which I am responsible, but Wallace would not agree. Still, Truman refused to fire him. Indeed, he hardly dared offend him. As the last surviving New Dealer in the cabinet, Wallace was too important symbolically, as Wallace knew and as Wallace knew Truman knew. For countless liberal Democrats, Wallace remained the rightful heir to the Roosevelt succession, while Truman was only a usurper. For Truman to have an open break with Wallace, anything like the Ickes affair, could be politically disastrous. The only agreement reached at last, after two and a half hours of talk, was that Wallace would say no more on foreign policy, at least until Burns came home. In the lobby afterward, when reporters asked if everything had been straightened out, Wallace replied, Everything's lovely. Henry is the most peculiar fellow I ever came in contact with, Truman informed his mother. In his diary, he was more explicit. Wallace was unsound intellectually and 100% pacifist. He wants to disband our armed forces, give Russia our atomic bomb secrets, and trust a bunch of adventurers in the Kremlin Politburo. I do not understand a dreamer like that. The Reds, Phonies, and Parlor Pinks seem to be banded together and are becoming a national danger. I'm afraid they are a sabotage front for Uncle Joe Stalin. They can see no wrong in Russia's four and a half million armed force, in Russia's loot of Poland, Austria, Hungary, Romania, Manchuria. They can see no wrong in Russia's living off the occupied countries to support the military occupation. At the Pentagon, at Truman's request, Secretaries Patterson and Forrestal issued a joint statement denying they knew of any responsible Army or Navy officer who had ever advocated or even suggested a policy or plan of attacking Russia. From Paris, Burns sent Truman a long, reasoned message asking to be relieved at once. When the administration is divided on its own foreign policy, it cannot hope to convince the world that the American people have a foreign policy. I do not want to ask you to do anything that would force Mr. Wallace out of the Cabinet. However, I do not think any man who professes any loyalty to you would so seriously impair your prestige and the prestige of the government with the nations of the world. You and I spent fifteen months building a bipartisan policy. We did a fine job convincing the world that it was a permanent policy upon which the world could rely. Wallace destroyed it in a day. At 9.30, the morning of Friday, September 20th, Truman called Wallace on the phone and fired him, and as Truman confided to Bess, Wallace was so nice about it I almost backed out. Then he added, I just don't understand the man, and he doesn't either. Further, Wallace offered to return an angry longhand letter, not abusive, but on a low level, as Wallace described it, that Truman had sent him the night before. You don't want this thing out, Wallace told Truman, and Truman gratefully agreed. He was very happy to take it back. Later, Wallace crossed the street from his office and posed for photographers, sitting peacefully on a park bench reading the comic papers. When at a crowded, hurriedly called press conference in his office, Truman made the announcement, there were audible gasps from reporters and one long, low whistle. Once the room was cleared, Truman sat down at his desk and, turning to Ross, who was standing nearby, said, Well, the die is cast. He had shown, Ross told him, that he would rather be right than president. I would rather be anything than president, Truman said. No man in his right mind would want to come here to the White House of his own accord, he had written earlier to Margaret. Now, wishing as always to shine untarnished in her eyes, he tried to excuse his handling of the Wallace affair by saying he had no gift for duplicity. To be a good president, he told her, one had to be a combination Machiavelli, Louis XI of France, Cesare Borgia, and Talleyrand. A liar, double-crosser, and unctuous religio, 
Richelieu, Hero, and what not. And he didn't have the stomach for it, thanks be to God. He was mulling history and his own life more and more. On September 26th, anniversary of the start of the Argonne Offensive of 1918, reflecting on the intervening years, he wrote in his diary as follows, referring to himself only as a serviceman of my acquaintance. The rage that filled his earlier rail strike speech was absent now, replaced by a kind of melancholy and disappointment, and an underlying resolve to face whatever he must. September 26, 1918, a few minutes before 4 a.m., a serviceman of my acquaintance was standing behind a battery of French 75s at a little town called Neuville, to the right of the Argonne Forest. A barrage was to be fired by all the guns on the Allied front from Belgium to the Swiss border. At 4 a.m. that barrage started. At 5 a.m. the infantry in front of my acquaintance's battery went over. At 8 a.m. the artillery, including the 75 battery referred to, moved forward. That forward movement did not stop until November 11, 1918. My acquaintance came home, was banqueted and treated as returned soldiers are usually treated by the home people immediately after the tension of war is relieved. The home people forgot the war. Two years later, turned out the administration, which had successfully conducted our part of the war and turned the clock back. They began to talk of disarmament. They did disarm themselves to the point of helplessness. They became fat and rich. Special privilege ran the country, ran it to a fall. In 1932, a great leader came forward and rescued the country from chaos and restored the confidence of the people in their government and their institutions. Then another European war came along. We tried as before to keep out of it. We refused to believe that we could get into it. The great leader warned the country of the possibility. He was vilified, smeared, misrepresented, but kept his courage. As was inevitable, we were forced into the war. The country awoke, late, but it awoke and created the greatest war production program in history under the great leader. The country furnished Russia, Britain, China, Australia, and all the Allies, guns, tanks, planes, food, in unheard of quantities, built, manned, and fought the greatest navy in history, created the most powerful and efficient air force ever heard of, and equipped an army of eight and a half million men and fought them on two fronts, 12,000 miles apart, and from 3,000 to 7,000 miles from the home base, created the greatest merchant marine in history in order to maintain those two battlefronts. The collapse of the enemies of liberty came almost simultaneously in May for the Eastern Front and in August for the Western Front. Unfortunately, the great leader who had taken the nation through the peacetime and wartime emergencies passed to his great reward just one month before the German surrender. What a pity for this to happen after twelve long years of the hardest kind of work, three and a half of them in the most terrible of all wars. My acquaintance who commanded the 75th Battery of September 26, 1918, took over. The same elation filled the home people as filled them after the First World War. They were happy to have the fighting stop and to quit worrying about their sons and daughters in the armed forces. Then the reaction set in. Selfishness, greed, jealousy raised their ugly heads. No wartime incentive to keep them down. Labor began to grab all it could get by fair means or foul. Farmers began black-marketing food. Industry hoarded inventories, and the same old pacifists began to talk disarmament. But my acquaintance tried to meet every situation and has met them up to now. Can he continue to outface the demagogues, the chiselers, the jealousies? Time only will tell. The human animal and his emotions change not much from age to age. He must change now, or he faces absolute and complete destruction, and maybe the insect age or an atmosphereless planet will succeed him. 5. Harold Ickes called him stupid. If the world had to depend on Truman and his administration to keep it out of trouble, wrote Time, then the world had much to worry about. Not in eighty years, not since Andrew Johnson, Lincoln's successor, had a president been the target of such abuse. He was made fun of for his mid-American mannerisms, his Missouri pals, the by now famous devotion to his mother. Every day is Mother's Day in the White House, it was said with a snicker. According to one of the latest Washington jokes in the autumn of 1946, Truman was late for a cabinet meeting because he woke up stiff in the joints from trying to put his foot in his mouth. A joke from Texas began with reflections on how Roosevelt might have handled the country's problems, then ended with the line, I wonder what Truman would do if he were alive. A Chicago Sun cartoon that was reprinted widely showed him pop-eyed and befuddled, one hand on his aching head asking, What next? In Boston, the Henry M. Frost Advertising Agency came up with an inspired two-word campaign slogan for the Republicans. Had enough? 
Truman's popularity had vanished. Poll results released the first week in October, a month before the congressional elections, showed only 40% of the country approved his performance. On the eve of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and what struck many as a bald play for the Jewish vote in New York, he called for admitting 100,000 Jewish refugees to the British Protectorate in Palestine. But the fact was he had already made the same statement months before, and Republican Thomas E. Dewey, who was running for re-election as governor of New York, now quickly outbid him for Jewish support by demanding that several hundred thousand Jews be permitted to migrate to Palestine. In another few weeks, Truman's standing in the polls plunged to a low of 32 percent, nearly 50 points below where it had been the year before. The depression that everyone had so feared had not come. Employment, even with all the strikes, was high. Money was plentiful. Business was booming. But the cost of living had also leaped six and a half points just since the end of 1945, and there were still acute shortages of the things people most wanted. Housing, automobiles, refrigerators, nylon stockings, sugar, coffee and, increasingly, meat. Speaker of the House Sam Rayburn, fearing a Democratic debacle at the polls, complained to a friend, this is going to be a damned beefsteak election. As November drew closer and the meat shortage grew worse, the Republicans capitalized on a made-to-order issue. Cattle raisers staged a strike, refusing to send cattle to market. Nothing on meat, Mr. President, Truman was asked by reporters on October 10th. Nothing on meat, he said. Democratic Party Chairman Bob Hannigan warned Truman that if controls on meat prices were not dropped, he could expect a Republican sweep. Truman told his staff he was sure to be damned whatever he did. If he ended controls, he would be accused of caving into pressure. If he left things as they were, he would continue to be seen as cause of all the trouble. Talk of his Pendergast connection was encouraged as Republicans stepped up the heat. He became again the little machine hack from backwater Missouri. New York showman Billy Rose suggested W.C. Fields for president in 1948, saying, if we're going to have a comedian in the White House, let's have a good one. The chairman of the Republican National Committee, Congressman Carol Reese of Tennessee, declared nothing remained of the Democratic Party but three distasteful elements, Southern racists, big city bosses, and radicals bent on Sovietizing the country. Discontent over meat shortages was one thing, fear of communist influence and infiltration was quite another, and in the long run far more important. A red scare was clearly on the rise. Edward T. Folliard of the Washington Post found hatred of communism rampant everywhere he traveled. Harry Truman, the Republicans charged, was pursuing a policy of appeasing the Russians abroad and fostering communism at home. The Democratic Party, said Senator Taft, was so divided between communism and Americanism that its foreign policy can only be futile and contradictory and make the United States the laughingstock of the world. John Tabor, a Republican congressman from Auburn, New York, who had a voice like a bullhorn, warned of communist infiltration of the universities, even the army, while in California, another Republican congressional candidate, young Richard M. Nixon, castigated high officials who front for un-American elements, wittingly or otherwise. Yet such attacks were hardly different in spirit from Truman's own private anxieties over reds and parlor pinks, and who could say, after the uncovering of the Ottawa spy ring, that there was no cause for alarm? That summer, under pressure from Attorney General Clark, Truman had secretly agreed to continuation of electronic surveillance in cases where the national defense was involved, a policy instituted by Roosevelt, although as Clark neglected to tell Truman, Roosevelt's original authorization in 1940 had been limited to aliens only. In a speech at San Francisco, J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI warned that no less than a 100,000 communists were loose in the country. The shrill pitch of abuse heaped upon the president continued to echo, wrote Time. So mild a man as Harry Truman might well wonder at the temper of his countrymen. Democrats were filled with despair. Bob Hannigan advised Truman that it would be best if he made no campaign appearances or political speeches, a decision Truman accepted. He kept to the White House. For days, for a portrait by Frank O. Salisbury, the British artist who had done Roosevelt, Truman posed in Charlie Ross's office, where three windows provided ample north light. On the afternoon the Supreme Court was to make its traditional White House call, he was listening to the deciding game of the 1946 World Series, the St. Louis Cardinals versus the Boston Red Sox, when a staff aide told him the justices would soon be arriving in formal attire. Truman hurried upstairs and changed into striped trousers and a swallowtail coat, only to find at the reception that he alone was formally dressed. <laughs>
Few campaigning Democrats even so much as mentioned the president's name. In some congressional contests, Democratic candidates resorted to playing old recordings of Roosevelt's speeches to boost their chances. Senator Harley Kilgore, a warm friend and admirer of Truman, who was running for re-election in West Virginia, found that in the back hollows and coal fields, the mere mention of Truman's name brought a chorus of boos and catcalls. Here was a man who was actually doing an excellent job, Kilgore would recall, but the most you could do was to defend him in a humorous fashion by using the old Western saloon refrain, Don't shoot our piano player, he's doing the best he can. The capacity to smile when in trouble is a prime requirement for a politician, as Truman, a career politician, had long understood, and now, as so often before in difficult times, he revealed no sign of anger or gloom. He never complained, never acted sorry for himself or blamed others. He was as cheerful and optimistic, as interested in others, as pleased to see them and to be with them as ever. As Alonzo Fields, who saw him daily and close up as only a butler could, later wrote of Truman, he never seemed to have a problem at this or any other time when worries beset him. I'm sure no one in the household could tell when he was troubled. On October 14th, three weeks before the election, Truman went on the radio to announce that reluctantly he was lifting price controls on meat. On October 23rd, he flew to New York to address the General Assembly of the United Nations at Flushing Meadow. The course of history, he said in a well-reasoned speech, has made us one of the stronger nations of the world. It has therefore placed upon us special responsibilities to conserve our strength and to use it rightly in a world so interdependent as our world today. Even the Russians complimented him. We went to the Waldorf afterward, he wrote Margaret. Your ma put on her best bib and tucker, and we went down to the ballroom for a reception. Shook hands with 835 people in one hour flat. Still, he kept silent on politics. Traveling home by train to Independence to vote, he was greeted at Jefferson City by a crowd of cheering schoolchildren who set up a chant. Make a two-hour speech. Make it a full holiday. But Truman, all smiles, only waved and shook his head, then clamped one hand over his mouth. The Republicans swept the election, carrying both houses of Congress for the first time since before the Depression, an era so distant to most people that it seemed another world. The margin in the House was 246 Republicans to 188 Democrats. In the Senate, 51 to 45. The Republicans took a majority of the state governorships as well, including New York, where Thomas E. Dewey was re-elected by the largest margin ever recorded. In one city after another, Chicago, Detroit, Jersey City, New York, Democratic machines went down to defeat. In Kansas City, Truman's own hand-picked candidate for Congress, Enos Axtell, lost to his Republican opponent by 6,000 votes, which Margaret Truman remembered as mortifying for her father. The Chicago Tribune hailed the Republican triumph as the greatest victory for the country since Appomattox. The New Deal had been finally put to flight, the grip of the Democrats in Washington broken at last. Harry Truman, the accidental president, was now also a minority president. A young Democratic congressman from Arkansas, J. William Fulbright, was so distressed by the Republican landslide and the likelihood of a two-year stalemate in Washington that he proposed Truman appoint Arthur Vandenberg Secretary of State, then resign and thus make Vandenberg president, an idea that led Truman to refer to Fulbright thereafter as half-bright. Truman and his family started back to Washington on Election Day without waiting for the polls to close. By arrangement, however, the election returns were to be put on board the train every hundred miles or so. That night, Charlie Ross came through the train to invite several Washington reporters to join the president in his private car for a poker game. The game was hot and heavy until about 2 a.m., remembered Merriman Smith of United Press. The returns had been arriving in a steady stream since 9 p.m. Not once did Truman look at them, nor did he refer to the elections. At one point, Margaret interrupted to say the results from Independence had come in. Truman, glancing at the slip of paper, shook his head and smiled up at her. "'Why bother with this sort of thing?' he said. "'Don't worry about me. I know how things will turn out, and they'll be all right.'" Probably no president since Andrew Johnson had run out of prestige and leadership more thoroughly than had Harry Truman when he returned almost unnoticed to Washington on that bleak, misty November morning in 1946 wrote Campbell Phillips. At Union Station, Truman stepped from his car, silent but smiling, a book under his arm. <laughs>